Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Dr. Clifford Oliver. Dr. Oliver has been involved in complementary holistic medicine since 1972. Have you ever wondered about the synchronicity of meeting certain people that have a chain reaction effect on your life, such that it is not only greatly improved, but results in the ability to enhance the lives of countless others? Have you ever been curious as to the history of holistic approaches in medicine, what many of them are, and why they're not being used with any regularity in medicine today, even though great doctors and therapists have been practicing and teaching them for a very long time? Today, we should all be pondering deeply the question, what is medicine? And I have the perfect guest to stimulate your meditation on the question, what is medicine? You get to meet Dr. Cliff Oliver, a man with almost 50 years of clinical experience ranging from being a registered nurse to becoming a chiropractor, a highly skilled expert in functional medicine, sound healing, and a wide variety of very effective therapeutic approaches such as the functional application of the polyvagal approach to balancing the autonomic nervous system and healing, and much more. Dr. Oliver and I have been working together since the 1990s, and together we've helped countless patients with serious challenges the medical system had no answers for. In fact, the standard medical approaches generally made these patients much worse with the application of drugs and surgery without following their own Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. The bigger truth is that using highly effective holistic therapies directed at the root cause of people's ailments, illnesses, and dysfunctions typically eliminates the need for more doctors, drugs, and surgeries, which is not part of the financial-driven business model of the American medical system, nor most traditional medical systems worldwide. In this amazing interview, you will hear Dr. Oliver's potent story of his life and progress as the wounded healer, all the amazing mentors he's worked with, the many alternative holistic approaches he's mastered, and why after all these years I continue to use him as my go-to doctor to this very day. Dr. Oliver is one of the most amazing, well-rounded, deep human beings I've ever met. He's what I call the real deal, and has enhanced my personal and professional life as much as any of the greatest teachers, leaders, therapists, and doctors I've studied in my 36-year career. If you want to answer the big question, what is medicine, then this interview will be an amazing eye-opening experience for you. And to top it all off, Dr. Oliver is offering all Living 4D with Paul Check listeners a 20% discount on a one-hour consultation. And believe me, one hour with Dr. Oliver can change your life. Let's have some fun and learn a lot with Dr. Oliver. Hi, everybody. You know, I've been testing Juve lights for about 90 days now. And one of the things that I've found is it's amazing for elevating my mood. Not that I need mood elevation, but when I sit by them, I get this warm, glowing sensation. Like I'm the same experience I get when I'm sitting out by the pool in the sunlight and just basking in the sun. And there's a lot of amazing benefits to Juve. And I wanted you to hear it from one of their technicians himself. So you get the technical details. So I've got Wes Feifner here from Juve. Wes, how is it that sitting next to my Juve lights gives me that warm kind of mood elevation that feels so gentle and so natural, but so opening? The main reason is because Juve is delivering wavelengths that you would normally get out in the sun. And nowadays, just because of our modern lifestyle, we don't get out in the sun enough. And we really are, are a lack of, of light nutrition. And so what Juve does is delivers healing wavelengths of light in the comfort of your own home. That's awesome. And they, they come in a wide variety of price ranges, and the smaller units go for 445 all the way up to the full body units, which is a real big comprehensive lighting system for people that really want to maximize their healing at 8500 You guys are offering a discount to my listeners, check listeners. Um, what's the discount for Living 4D listeners, and how do they get to purchase their Juve light? So if you're interested in checking out Juve, head over to juve.com, J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash check and use code check 50 to save $50 on your first purchase. There you go. I absolutely love my Juve lights or I would not be telling you about it. Enjoy Juve. Hello, everybody. I don't know if you're aware, but there is a tremendous amount of confusion about stretching amongst athletes, therapists, and people in general. For example, here are some misconceptions that result in inefficient, ineffective stretching or may even set you up for injury. A. You should stretch all the muscles in your body in a stretching session. This concept ignores the principle of balance. Think of a bicycle wheel that's out of balance. If you loosen all the spokes, will you get a balanced wheel? 
Everyone should stretch. Though stretching in general is good for people, there are many people with hypermobile joints. Stretching the muscles crossing such joints increases hypermobility, facilitating joint dysfunction, inflammation, degenerative changes, and pain. If you don't stretch hard enough, you won't get good results. This misconception is common amongst martial artists and unskilled teachers and practitioners of yoga. The truth is that you should consider a tight muscle like a crying baby and move into the stretch gently. Coupling stretching actions with conscious breathing actually enhances short and long-term benefits and long-term range of motion changes. Another common misconception is that you should do a good stretch before an athletic event to get the best results. Though this is a true concept, the problem is that most athletes use static stretching or long hold stretches to loosen tight muscles before athletic events. This, as I show in my scientific stretching program, results in a lot of muscle injuries. This is one of the most common reasons sprinters tear hamstring muscles, and in the course, I show you why this happens. The truth is, even when people have a solid understanding of the physical side of stretching, it's still only a mechanical process. The human body is much more complex than that. Mechanical approaches to stretching don't offer the true depth and power of stretching scientifically. It is well known in many healing arts and well described in books like Stanley Kelman's Emotional Anatomy that muscles, joints, and connective tissue all respond to one's thoughts, feelings, and emotions. This is clearly defined when we study the anatomy of yoga and the chakra system. Each part, be it internal or external, is linked to an associated chakra and corresponding mental-emotional challenges that are unresolved in the individual. Tight muscles often result from such energies being stored in the body. In scientific stretching, not only do I show you how to read the body from many perspectives, I give comprehensive explanations on this process and tips for using stretching, breathing, pressure release, and awareness so anyone can heal and restore emotional and mental balance to their body-mind as part of a holistic approach. Learning to stretch properly gives you a lot of information that can help you at every level of your being. For trainers, coaches, and therapists of any type, the information I share can be applied and greatly increase the effectiveness of one's therapeutic approach. Getting great results is always great for business. My new course, Scientific Stretching, will teach you not only the best way to stretch and improve your health and performance physically, but will help you see and realize the deeper mental, emotional, and spiritual benefits of stretching as well. One of the real benefits of the teachings I share is that you learn the language of the body and realize that it's always talking to you, giving you tips, and making suggestions as to where change is needed, be it your exercise program, stretching program, diet and lifestyle, your relationships, or even your overall disposition. In my new scientific stretching course, you will learn what stretching offers us for achieving health and well-being. My 1234 model of stretching. Stretching assessments for targeted stretching, including what types of stretching work best in different situations. The pressure release method for improving mobility and flow. The mental-emotional relationships to body restriction. The fascia-water relationship. And much, much more. As with all the courses in my scientific e-learning series, this course is extremely comprehensive and will give you a perspective on stretching that will help you and your clients see tremendous long-term results. For professionals using stretching as part of their practice, scientific stretching will give you the kind of advantage a calculator would have given you in math class before anyone else had one. Scientific stretching includes 11 videos with over 8 hours of education plus a PDF manual to help you follow along. I've developed these techniques in the 37 years of my clinical practice working with all sorts from all sports, so it has been time-tested over a lot of years. My clinical approach to stretching will support balancing your body, reduce injury, speed healing, free trapped emotions, help you read your body and maintain a healthy dialogue with it, differentiate and learn to use pre-event, post-event maintenance, and corrective stretching approaches effectively, and much, much more. Get started now at checkinstitute.com forward slash stretching. That's C-H-E-K institute.com forward slash stretching. Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and 
collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them, though, is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors to come, and they're easy to put in your bag to feed for you with your kids. And I hope you love them all as much as I do. All you have to do to get access is go to paleovalley.com, and you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K, 15, and you can get 15% off. And I hope you love them. That's awesome. And just so you know, that's P-A-L-E-O valley.com. And I know you're going to love Autumn Superfood Bars. Hello, everybody. Today, we're going to start off with Dr. Oliver and I sharing some love with all of you. spirit. Oh. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have a long-time friend and mentor, Dr. Cliff Oliver. He and I have a long history together. He actually helped me build the Czech Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Program, and we have traveled the world together. We've done a lot of sound healings together, helped countless people all over the world, and uh, he's got a very, very interesting background and a very, very deep well of knowledge. I think Dr. Oliver has probably turned me on to more amazing books than anybody, so there's probably at least 50 or 100 of them in here that came from his mind, and he brought me some more today. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> and I, sh- I always try to turn him on to some too. Yeah. We have, a, we have an equal addiction. Yes. Learning and sharing. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. The, the, like they say in law of one, teach, learn, and learn, teach. Right. But Dr. Oliver began his career as a nurse and then became a chiropractor. And his 
history of studies with pioneers is very fascinating. So today we're going to get into uh, a lot of different things with Dr. Oliver, but uh, I think you're going to be fascinated with the things he has to share and the things he's observed in his career and his viewpoints on many of the issues of the world today. So, Dr. Oliver, thanks for coming back. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I mean, I'm really we, looking forward to it. We got to make uh, music again. That music in the yeah. beginning was Dr. Oliver and I, and uh, we did a we did this recording before, but we had a very strange, weird technological issue, and the recording turned out to be unusable, which we think was because a iPhone was close to the recorder. I, I think it's a high energy. Might be the high energy. Yeah, I, I'm sure it was high energy. It's got to be. We just blew it out. We blew it out. <laughs> Let's hope we don't. Penny's got us double mic'd today and double recorders, so we're we're ready for all the spirits. And so uh, we we did it, but uh, it was an amazing podcast too. I was heartbroken when that happened. So we're back to share it all again and do it even better. Right. Dr. Oliver, can you share an overview of your developmental history and what led to you becoming a chiropractor? How did you get started? Because the story of how this all began was fascinating, so I'm actually looking forward to hearing it again. <laughs> you know, it's, it's convoluted like all of our stories are. Mm -hmm. You know, we sort of set a path, and our path takes turns. Yes. You know, we never know what's taking us on that turn until we're there. Right. But on mine, you know, I was in the military. And while I was in the military, I got hurt. Right. And I had a pretty significant injury um, with uh, some surgeries. Ended up in the hospital for 13 months and three days. That's a long time in the hospital. That's a long time. You don't you want didn't, to. You, you didn't have want, your flute either, did you? you no. Know, <laughs> and you, you don't want to be there in a military hospital no, doing that. That's even worse. <laughs> and then, and especially when they transfer you to San Francisco, right in the middle of the hippie. The you know summer of love and, oh. you're, and you're in there being pumped with drugs and all oh. the people in Vietnam are coming back with their legs blown oh off. Oh my and, god! Yeah, it was such a dichotomy. It was amazing. So when I got out, um, I really wanted to continue it on with my love, which was sailing and the water. And I used to do architecture for a company making sailboat masts. So mm. I wanted to become a naval architect. So um, I got the opportunity through the GI Bill to go to San Diego State to be on their sailing team. Mm. So that took me to San Diego. Nice. And, and you I, haven't left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I had to take some little side tricks for yeah. uh, advanced education, yes, right? Yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but while I was there, you know, it was amazing. So I, I'm there and I signed up to be a naval architect and transferred to Berkeley. And But along the way, I got kind of turned off to the... Uh, engineering department mm. it was very uh should we say linear yes yes mm -hmm. not really knowing those terms at the time but looking back yeah. it was exceedingly linear and yeah. it was a very male yes uh, but anyhow so it didn't work out so well and i had this amazing um uh what do you call him uh, uh counselor from mm -hmm. the VA. Right. So here's this guy from the VA counseling, and it's not working out for me in the engineering, engineering department. Not, I mean, talking about following your heart and noticing when you touch into your body and you notice something's not right. Yes. And then actually taking that Direction. information, <laughs> right, yeah. and saying, time out, yeah. right? I'm checking out. It's time out. And the guy let me. Well, you know, the thing is, is how many people's lives would be much better if they just listen to the soul speaking through the oh, musical instrument of the body. If only. You know? If only. It's just like, wow, that's what religion was supposed to give us. It was, exactly. So I listened, I responded, and the guy let me. The counselor, this guy let me. And so I go, what do you, she goes, what do you want to do? And I said, you know, I think I need something creative after doing that. Yes. So I'm going into creative writing. Very good. So my very first semester, I go into my first class, and the guy comes in and goes, uh, your teacher can't do it. He's, we have a different, you know, I'm a substitute guy. I'm taking over the class. It's not creative writing. It's poetry. Oh, good. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, I, I have no idea. But I sat through his little talk. I fell in love with it. So Perfect. I spent two years doing poetry, staying up late at night, writing poems, reading poetry, diving deep di and surfing and sailing, right? Good. So it was like this perfect, from this very left brain to this total right brain. It was amazing. Great experience. But after two years, the guy got fired. The counselor got fired. Oh. and said, people can't be doing on a career path that has no outcome. 
<laughs> Typical military oh, thing. Oh, completely, right? Yeah. So I had to fall back on, wow, what do I do next? What am I going to do? How am I going to make a job? How am I going to do this? Well, my last month or two in the hospital, this 13-month little journey, there was a nurse who took me under a wing and literally took me by the hand and led me down a path to curiosity, exploring. She got me enrolled in, of all things, um, doing kind of writing and doing shorthand. Oh, wow. So what came up to me, again, doing a deep dive into your heart was, wow, maybe I should go into nursing, go into something where I was helped and where I could help people. So I entered the nursing program at San Diego State, still on the sailing team, still surfing. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I started making surfboards. Right. So I got my real creative juices going because I wasn't into the poetry now and went through the nursing department, got my Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Got done, but I was making surfboards during this time, mm -hmm. and it got so big, and it was such a part of my life that I started making surfboards. Mm, so you never went through with the nursing career? Yeah, yeah, I got my degree, got my license, did that, and I actually ended up teaching career alternatives for nursing at UCSD Extension. And you taught them poetry. <laughs> <laughs> so during this career, this little spin into making surfboards, which was my love and passion, I got harassed continuously by the fire department, by OSHA, by... City health departments, I mean, crazy. You have a big room making surfboards. Anybody know surfboards, resins and mm -hmm. drippings? And, yeah. And they, you know, basically shut me down for not having a handicap, oh. like a wheelchair. Yeah. Yeah. And a surfboard factory? I don't think so. But, yeah. But anyhow, so that went on for several years. And, uh, you know, again, I have to make a directional change. Yeah. So during that time, I was taken to this chiropractor's office down in uh, San Diego, and the guy was going, and it was in this basement. This is this old guy, and he just had all this wisdom. Mm. And he was telling me about these blocks and this stuff. And it was basically sacral occipital technique. Oh, yeah. D. You know? Yeah. yeah. And, the guy, and the guy was a total devotee. Yeah. So during that time, also, I got the very good opportunity to participate in the first Mandala conferences. So if anybody knows about the Mandala conferences, they're in the mid 70s, their first holistic conferences in the world, and they're in San Diego. Mm. So um, I got to meet wonderful people, Paul Brenner, mm. a bunch of people became lifelong friends from these conferences, but it was the first holistic conferences. And I was like taken away with it. Mm. And one of the people who was presenting there was a Dr. John Thee. Yes. I had no idea it was Touch a chiropractor. Touch for health, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I had no idea. So here I'm being shut down by the fire department, ocean, all these people. And I end up meeting this guy and I go, wow, John Thee was an amazing person. Maybe I should go visit him. Mm. So I go up. He has a big clinic up in Altadena. So up above Pasadena, some people know that Rose Bowl, mm -hmm. Rose Parade. I go up to his office. The first thing I go into his office, he has like a two-story in a basement. He's got a bunch of docs working for him. I see people walking around like uh, Dwight Stone, you know, the, the high jumper, the oh, runners. Oh, yes, yeah. That's a um, while back, yeah. Yeah, Steve Garvey. All these people are running around this office. I'm going, what are these people doing here? Well, they're obviously there to improve their performance. Right. So I came to the conclusion that's what chiropractors did. Well, well. They improve whatever you are, mm -hmm. right? They're not treating illness. They're not treating sickness. They're not all the nursing stuff, right? right? Yes. That I wasn't so involved with, but I mm. like the concept of health. So that was an amazing experience. So I'm sitting there, you go up to his private office and he, you know, did touch for health. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, he, touch for health. He had healing touch and touch for health. Right. Because I'm so involved with the healing touch people, but touch for health. Yeah. And his idea was that to see him, you had to learn this system of using meridians and acupuncture points and reflexes to help your neighbor get well, your family member. Oh. So you would go into this open bay with some tables in there and you would learn to treat people mm. who were coming to see him. So they were learning from the doctor, which and is cool because doctor means teacher. Exactly. So they were learning to work on each other. That's great. Even though they didn't know each other, they were working on each other. And then he'd take them to another room, do some a couple of adjustments, and they'd be out there teach, you know, working on themselves. I was blown away. I said, that's for me. That sounds great. So he said, oh, you got to sign up. You got to go to the school I went to. You got to go to Los Angeles Chiropractic College. I went, I'm in. I used to teach there. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. No, I did not. Yeah, I used to, uh, Daryl Curl. Yeah, Remember? yeah. Daryl Curl used yeah. to bring me up there and give lectures on the science of how the core functions. Perfect. I taught to a number of classes for a few years, and I've actually received a few letters from chiropractors. Nice. that. Gone through, were in my classes, graduated, now had 
kids and families and practices and you out of the blue it. sent me a letter going i'm still using all the things you taught me <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love it. i just got a notice in the mail that's going to have a uh, the reunion party oh, next week neat 40th year reunion wow party. oh wow yeah that went like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it does go fast yeah so i got into chiropractic and then i while i was in there i realized there's this split in the profession yeah there's straights and there's mixers and it was like what the heck i thought i'm getting in there to help people well whatever it took right well there's the, the other tr- one straights mixers and the hole in one. Oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well they're kind of the straights do they kind of fit yeah. in that category yeah a subcategory subcategory <laughs> <laughs> they just narrow it down to one <laughs> yeah so i was blown away i was going what the heck how can there be such this fight within a profession trying to get people well yeah. obviously i was in the mixer group i was like into holistic health i was into all this stuff related to nutrition and so i basically went through it kind of disappointed in the the profession because of this fighting going on, but started practice and uh, got involved with a lot of interesting people along the way. So I went into private practice and, uh, you know, from there just started meeting people and eyes open and met tons of great people along the journey. That's amazing. You know, one of the concepts that I know you're familiar with because you've just described living through it and I've certainly lived through it, it's fairly well known amongst the more holistic elites that the wounded doctor is the best doctor right love it if you could share your thoughts on why it is that the wounded doctor which could also be the wounded therapist right are generally the best therapists and doctors to yeah. see yeah it's an interesting concept and it, it it's again that's kind of a it's kind of double-edged too um so one of the things I noticed right at early on in medicine is people get in for different reasons, right? And there's a certain percentage get in it for the money. Yeah, I was going to say, some of them get in to make money, which is never the best motive. Yeah, and those people aren't particularly wounded. And then early on when I was in my nursing thing, I was thinking, maybe I should go on into medicine. And I really was drawn to psychiatry because of specifically um, people like... Um, Who's in and out of the garbage pill? Uh, what was that? Fritz Perls. Fritz Perls. Yeah. So I was totally into his work and mm-hmm. his and his and then Stan Groff. Stanislaw Groff. That's amazing. So I was totally captured by these people, and I, you know, I went and I did these special education seminars and stuff, and I just totally thought this this was really the root of what a lot of issues were. But what was so interesting was during my nursing program, I had to go through you know, semesters at these different institutions like Mercy Hospital, like the VA. Yeah. And one of them was on the mental health. Yes. You know, and when I'm in there, we had to do, you know, electroshock therapy. Right. I remember you telling me about that. And I was so stunned. So I was like, wait a minute, we're doing this to like 15-year-old kids, 16-year-old kids. They can't even find their way back to the room. And they're doing this for their depression. In other words, I was completely shocked. How could people do this to somebody? Couldn't they figure out another way? Right. Couldn't they figure out some sort of nutritional, right? Yeah. So I started checking around with the psychiatrist, and a lot of those were wounded, and they're into the field trying to cure themselves. Right. But they were taking their neuroses into the into the room, and they were right. shocking these kids. Oh. So I, I, the concept of the you know the wounded healer and that I think is got a couple different edges to it you know yes. they're wounded in a certain way and then that neurosis ends up on the client so is, that's 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 the um unhealed wound exactly that, the that's, dark side of that yeah, yeah. And, and i think that's very real but but you and i both know that the concept of the wounded healer really relates to those who have made the path to right. wholeness yeah and so on that side of it i think it's absolutely and the big thing that it gives a person is compassion yeah and i think the compassion is so missing in this just this last year we're in the covid year and what we've missed is that people aren't seeing what's actually happening to the people right right there's no compassion in stopping therapies of hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin there's no compassion about what's available and helping people out so i think the big thing that being injured in the system and then coming out of it yeah is i think the biggest thing that is compassion. You know, I want to interject. You're making a very important point. And my immediate reaction to hearing you say what you've just said is 
from a psychological perspective, it says a lot about the people that are driving this whole COVID oh. issue. I mean, to to what kind of a mental state do these people have to be in to inflict this kind of not only bullshit, but it's it's incomprehensible. Yeah, I mean, you're dealing with uh, almost you know serious psychopathy. How can a whole profession totally ignore a condition? And tell people to go home and sit home until they're so bad off that they have to be in the hospital in an ICU. Or it's and, never. I mean, what? what and what, the rates of suicide. Oh, it's, they're skyrocketing. They're going to get way worse because this continuing lockdowns and masking and yeah. shutting off all sense of safety. Yes. And co-regulation, right? Like we're doing. Yes. We're here with each other communicating, yeah. eyes open <laughs> freely. Yes. And they're not letting people do that to this day. Yeah. I, I was just I was just telling you when I came up here, the most horrifying thing I ever saw, I went by an elementary school and they're out doing jumping jacks with masks on. Yeah, I mean, crazy stuff. I mean, nuts. There's a great talk just recently, a couple of days ago by Peter McCullough, one of the world's most famous cardiologists out of Baylor University. About 85% of the people did not have to die. Right, if that's they would probably have, very true. If they would have just instigated care. Right. And they would have instigated care if they were compassionate. Yes. Unbelievable. I mean, yeah. talking about a fail of a, of a profession. I, yeah. it's le I mean, it's, it's the worst thing that's ever happened in this world. Not only a fail of the medical profession, but a fail of the government and, in my opinion, the military. When I was a paratrooper, I had to swear into the military under the oath to protect the United States of America against enemies foreign and domestic. Right. And clearly, right. there's enough information out there that makes it very, very evident that this was handled radically inappropriately, radically. way overstated, bogus science, and the list is very, very long. So the fact And it that, keeps going on. Yes, and the fact <laughs> that it keeps going on... Is shocking. ...is bad news... And, you know, without turning this into a COVID discussion, yeah, I yeah. would just simply say that it's, it's, uh, there's psychopathy at the top and it, and, and anybody in the government and the military and in medicine that's following the drumbeat that's behind all this clearly is diagnosing themselves. Yeah. And, and, and when you see, I mean, you talk about trickle down, mm -hmm. it's not even trickling down, it's forced it's down. forced down, yeah. And you see little kids, elementary school kids, doing jumping jacks with masks on. You have a dear friend whose four-year-old daughter, the school down the street in Virginia, starts school a month or two ago. The kids come out, and they only staggered. They come out with their mask on. The little girl, four years, runs up to her buddy, gives her a hug, her friend with her mask on, and her friend goes, get away, COVID. Oh, my God. This is a five-year-old talking to a four-year-old. Then the oh. four-year-old's... 13 year old brother goes to give her a hug, and the little girl, after one instance, goes, Stay away, COVID, to her oh, brother. Oh, wow, yeah. I mean, they're wounding these people. Yeah. Just horrifying. It's they're preying on people's lack of understanding, lack of knowledge. And then they're censoring any knowledge coming through. To oh, them. I know. That's just, just, oh. that's, that's just a, the icing on the evil cake. Oh, is, it's so bad. You know, the, the, you, you know, the censoring is, is not only very, very dangerous, but it's the same thing as monocropping in nature. Right. You know, right. once you take away diversity, you remove stability. Yeah. So when you start looking Soils at all this stuff, there's gone. a there's a very sinister unfolding going on. And yeah. you know, it's it's sad, but it's you know, what do we do except use this as an opportunity to hold hands and say, we have to rise above this because right. there's only a few of them and there's a lot of us. So right. it's a matter of people really getting clear on what they want. You know, yeah. when, when the pain teacher shows up, it's, it's time to make choices and right. you can either choose to live your life wrapped in masks that don't work or you can choose and your fear. life. Yeah. And fear, or you can say, like, we're not going to live this way. And you can do the work to look at the wise doctors and track them down, even though they're knocking a lot of them off. People like Zach Bush and Mercola and oh. Sawyer G and his wife, Kelly Brogan, and a long list of right. people have created independent sites so that anybody can find the information. And I think part of the problem is, is that, uh, you know, we've got a population and I have questions on this in there for you, but we have a population that has become so numb to using 
both halves of their mind right. for constructive thinking. They just believe anything that comes up on a screen like it's fact. I know. It's, it's, it's stunning. Yeah. And it's happened so quick. Yes, it you has. Know? It's like these kids, these poor kids. We used to say everybody in like 2000 on was highly probable that they'd end up with diabetes, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it ruined the healthcare system. Yes. Little did we know the thing that was going to take them over the top was video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How funny. I mean, not funny, but no, funny. But, oh, <laughs> funny man. as in odd, you know, yeah. the unexpected, the, the right angle surprise. Right. <laughs> and it was like dramatically off the cliff to obesity. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah, we can get into this because we've got, much to talk about but you know the the topic the title of 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 the show i gave today is what is medicine because i mean you've been in this business now for how many years well 40 years next week in the chiropractic field but actually in medicine uh 50 years yeah 52 53 years yeah yeah so i've been in mine i've been doing what i do for 37 so i've seen a lot and i know you've seen more so you know with that much experience, it's clear that you've seen the concept of medicine metamorphosize from one thing to the other. Right. And I don't think people really in the world know what medicine means anymore. I'd yeah. love it if you could share from your life experience and professional experience, what is medicine? Yeah. In, so, so I was kind of blessed, right? So I, I go through this military experience. I go through my training. I go through the hospital work do all that. So I, I see what medicine was in that day. Right. You know, and it was basically diagnosing, finding a problem, finding a fix for the problem. But still, even though that model was so didactically into, even at that time, into medicine meaning drugs. Mm -hmm. So I got to clarify that. Yeah. Surgery and drugs oriented, that people were revolting. Yeah. So here pops up this holistic health movement. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say around 75. Mm -hmm. And so the Mandala Conference, there was probably three, 400, 500 people there. And they're mainly medical doctors, a few chiropractors, but mainly medical doctors. Nature Naturopaths had had their license taken away. Oh. Osteopaths had had it taken away, right? They, ha they weren't even licensed, you know, getting their licenses back. It was, it was radical. So here's this group of doctors saying, this is the way. It's really about holistic. And interestingly enough, so these are medical people. Their concept was we should have a debate. What does holistic mean? Right. And the debate was, is it mind, body, spirit? Is it, or is it spirit, like holistic? Is it H-O or is it W-H-O? Like the yeah. whole being or is it holistic coming from spirit? Yes. That was the debate. Wow. I mean, that's not even the debate today. I mean, it's like it's been co-opted into integrating medicine, right? Right. But it was good. It was a, it was a great debate because as we are, I mean, we're into this mind, body, spirit. Mm -hmm. So I was on board with that. I thought, wow, this is the best thing I've ever seen, right? It's incorporating all aspects of the being, your spiritual development, your emotional development, your physical development, and bringing that all together. And that's what they wanted medicine to be. That's what it should be. By that's God. what it should be. So I'm thinking the next year they have the conference. The next year, so there's three years in a row, meaning amazing people get... Uh, Valerie Hunt, all these, oh, yes. just all these amazing people. So I'm, mind. Think, so I'm thinking this is just going to go along. Yes. But the powers to be did not want this. They wanted their model. They wanted their drugs and surgery. Their, and, you know, and the Rockefeller family. <laughs> completely. So here's this group of people and they just end up sort of moving apart. You know, people like Paul Brenner, brilliant doctor who's involved in this. He's he just bails out. He just takes a car and drives away, right? Because it was being so suppressed. All these people went back to their facilities, the university, the scripts, and it's just suppressed. You're not going to do that in here. You're going to be up there doing Tai Chi on the front lawn. <laughs> yeah. Get out of here. That's so amazing. It's so amazing. So what is medicine? I mean, it's co-op from a group of people wanting this holistic model. And then people like Andrew Wilde came along and sort of took that mm -hmm. and developed integrative medicine. Right. So a step up, they're bringing in other ideas and thoughts and processes and herbs and breathing. So that's a nice step up. 
but it hasn't been integrated into mainstream medicine. No, because it works. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't have an IC. It doesn't have a code. Yeah, it you can't code. build an insurance company. Yes, and it looks at the root cause. And if you start f- getting people cured, then they're not good for your business plan. Yeah. yeah. You know? So, so I often, you know, I, I get asked to do consults. So I just got a call the other day from a person wanted me to look at their lab work, and I'm thinking, well, if I look at your lab work, I don't have any context, right? Right. But that's how their lab works looked at. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. well, you're in the. Oh, wait, you're uh, you're in the out of normal. No, 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 no. Here's a drug. Yes, and, and that brings up a point that I want to share, and that is what medicine has done, which is following the internet and yeah. the powers that be, is turn people into data sets. Completely. So they're not dealing with a human being. They're dealing with numbers on a piece of paper, but yeah. not looking at how those numbers are being driven up or down exactly. by the stress factors that we address in holistic lifestyle coach training right. and what are inherently holistic healing and holistic yeah. health and holistic medicine. So the, the, the thing I'm really trying to draw out of you though, is if you can encapsulate in your own words, what medicine really is. I yeah. understand the holistic debate, the allopathic right, right. silliness, but if you were writing a book titled, What is Medicine? How would you encapsulate that concept so that yeah. people can really understand when they're getting medicine or when they're getting um, symptom suppression? Right, right. Yeah, I'd almost have to change the, you know, I'd have to have a subtitle, mm-hmm. Healing, yes, right? Yeah. right? So medicine has been so co-opted, right? Yeah. We, we don't, it's hard for us to even isolate out the word, conceptualize yeah. it, because we have this like data points, yeah. which is dramatically increased, yeah. right, from everything that they do, to what did it start out? What was Hippocrates? Well, well, what did he say medicine was? He's, food, make food your medicine, Yeah, right? make food, ma- food is man's best medicine. Yeah, exactly. So if we look at it, if we throw back to that time, I'd say medicine is really about the, the path to health. Yes. Right? And so medicine can come from in all sorts of sizes and shapes. And it can come from inside of you. Absolutely. In fact, getting the co-regulation, we talked a little bit about polyvagal, but co-regulation, the outside interaction, and the self-regulation. Yes. Right? And it's the marrying of those two. Yeah. Right? It's, people don't know how to listen to their selves. No. Right? They don't ever put their hand on their heart. As we were talking before we went on the air, listening to your heartbeat, right? Yes. Yeah. Right? It's a lost art. Yes. It's a lost art. Yeah. So I would say, to me, medicine is really about your path mm-hmm. to well-being, mm-hmm. right? Uh, not necessarily health, but well-being. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if it was you, but I have a feeling it might have been you. Did you turn me on to Margaret Newman's work? No. Do you know Margaret Newman? I don't. Oh, my God. She is somebody who you would be fascinated by. She's, I think she's dead now, but she was a holistic nurse. And she was very deep into consciousness and Itzhak Bentov's work and all sorts of just cutting edge holistic concepts. And uh, she worked in the hospital system for 35 years trying to educate them on why holistic nursing was the only effective way to nurse, but she just got rejected, 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 you know? Well, that's what came out of this Mandala conference, right? Right. Here's all these 500 docs. You know, they dispersed to their communities and they got shut down. And it's the same thing with healing touch. That was a nursing practice, right? Yes. Therapeutic touch. That yes. was the original one. Therapeutic touch. Even Reiki is used by a lot of nurses. Yeah. Therapeutic touch by a nurse, invented by a nurse, for a nurse to do. And they, what they did, they did studies on doing like hands-on energy work. What happened to the blood work? So it was all very scientific. Yes. You can go to Scripps today and you can have a healing touch practitioner come into the room. They have one per ward certified. Will they let the person do it? Hardly. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's probably been an, sitting uh, around reading a book. It's been an uphill while battle. 700 people yeah. desperately in Oh, need. they they want to get into it, but the the way this system's run is. Well, that's what I mean. Just the, the poor healing touch or yeah. Reiki therapist is just sitting there rotting because they're not getting any. People. Yeah, they're not being utilized. They're not being utilized. And they know it cuts down dramatically on everything from intensive care, cardiac recovery. It's it's amazing. Well, the reason I brought up Margaret Newman is because she had a very beautiful concept 
of what illness and disease are. Her one of the things that she really tried to bring forth in their work, her work, is to get away from the idea that because you're sick or you have a disease that you're not healthy. And so, you know, in in our modern concept, we, we think if someone's got cancer or they've got a disease, they're not healthy. Right. But what, what her approach was, which is is very shamanic in a lot of ways, is that our bodies and our psyches are always doing what they need to do to balance us. And that what's happening in the disease process is actually a healing process in um in process, right? It's right. it's unfolding. But she was describing how our illnesses and our injuries and our diseases are actually there to guide us into ourselves and into an awakening of our potentials and into a deeper understanding of the causative forces, be they chronic fear or judgment or unresolved right. traumas. But her whole approach was really the realization that the illness, the injury, or the disease is a gift from soul or from right. spirit or from life circumstances, kind of like a puzzle that if you put the pieces together, you unlock the riddle and it frees you and now you're a wiser, more right. capable um, person who can engage life more fully and be a positive influence on other yeah. people. Diametrically opposed by medicine today, as yes. we know it. Yeah. 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 No, that's a great ball. And early on, I, you know, studied with some wonderful people, again, Valerie Hunt and people like that. And mm -hmm. th th that was their basic concept. Yes. Right. And when people would come to me with cancer diagnosis and say, we're going to fight it. Right. Right. And we're going to, we're going to just, we're going to just nuke it. We're going to bomb it. I go, isn't that part of you? Yeah. <laughs> isn't, isn't there a story to be told here? Isn't there something about acceptance and honoring whatever that part of you is mm -hmm. doing? Yeah. W wouldn't that feel different to you if I said, wow, what if you loved it mm -hmm. versus you want to kill it? And it really, I, yeah, oh. it really goes back to the medical model of the body as a machine. Oh, yeah. You know, just take the part out and put whatever you can put back in there. And if there's not a replacement part, well, you lose your arm, you lose your leg, tough right. titties, yeah. uh, you know, here, here's some pain drugs. You can get addicted to these for the rest of your life and you'll be our best customer. So yeah. it's, it's kind of a, a, yeah. And it's been specialized, right? There's yeah. something like nine specialists for the heart or yes. the eye, just, just an ophthalmologist. There's like the, you know, there's subspecialties within the specialty. I, and I love this, the framing, you know, you know what a specialist, specialist is. You told me, but yeah. I, was, I was just going to ask yeah. you to share yeah. that. <laughs> Which is what medicine has become, yeah. right? They know more and more about less and less until they know absolutely everything about nothing. Right. And right? That's, that's the sad part of it. It's the sad part. And the other sad part of it is they don't talk to each other. At all. So you have someone who... As an expert, maybe at cornea transplant or a valve in the heart or the knee or the shoulder yeah. or the spine, right. but none of these people actually cross pollinate. And the system's set up to make it that way. It's just unbelievable. It's crazy. Yeah. So the, the the kind of the strange question you got to ask is how can such a dysfunctional system survive as long as it has? It's amazing. Like what's behind that? You know. Uh, I don't want to upset the doctors out there and the nurses that really do have their heart open and do a good job. And my hat's off to all of them, as I'm sure yours is, because right. both of us know people like that. But you have to ask yourself, is this organized crime or is this medicine? Because if you have the kind of background you and I have, and both of us have made a living on medical failures. I mean, that's what right. we specialize in is people that can't get help anywhere else, which <laughs> obviously keeps <laughs> us both very busy and many others. In fact, right. almost everybody that we've ever trained. trained exactly. <laughs> so, and they're all busy. Um, you know, you have to ask yourself, what is it that can keep such a pathological system alive? And then when you look at this whole bogus insurance thing they inflicted right. on us i think it was was it uh um clinton that implemented that the everyone uh, has to have the medical insurance or was that obama uh, i'm not sure which one but 
you know, if you look at that same model, what's happened with insurance and this whole model of specialization, anybody who had a pet, anybody who had a dog 40 years ago and went to a vet, they paid 25 bucks for a visit. Yes. There was no insurance. There was no nothing. Right. Right. And now almost every pet of the little dog area of the beach I go to has had cancer now. Yes. The, bad food, bad, horrible. Oh, yeah. And it's showing up. Talk about the canary in the coal mine. Coal mine. Here's all these dogs. By the time they're five or seven, they're coming down with some sort of cancer, oh, tumors, everything bad. Now the vets, you know, all are paying insurance. Oh. Vet bills are off the top. They're all getting chemo. And oh. I'm like, what the heck? Now they're ruining the animal population. Yeah. It's, it's just pretty dramatic. You know, it really shows you the play of light and dark, doesn't it? I would say so. And, and, and they built their little castle. Who was that? Was it Mendelssohn? I think he wrote a book about the Church of Medicine. <laughs> well, I think it was Mendelssohn. It's, it's quite a good title. <laughs> the Church of Medicine. And, and, and their little church is they set it up to keep everybody else out. Right. Be it chiropractors, be yeah. it nature mm -hmm. paths, be it. And they only let them in for a little piece of it if they do their little piece of the pie, right? Yeah, they let them in to see what they've got to suppress. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they let them in for. Drug studies. They've made them so expensive and so outrageous that people can't even get in there if they have a, a, a great drug, right? right? Yeah. Chlorine dioxide, all these different things. They can't even get in there because they made the model so that they get the, they keep it. They did the same thing with farming. You know, like where I grew up, a lot of our local guys that I grew up with were dairy farmers. And mm -hmm. many of the students that have come through HLC from all over the world come from farms and a lot of them dairy farms. And, uh, and I've read in Acres USA and many of the publications right. from the British Soil Association onward that they actually have done the same thing in farming that they did in medicine by making it so radically expensive and so many inspections right. that you have to pay for at huge prices that hardly anybody can afford to farm and you can't get any kind of certification or approval and then they attack you saying that you're farming illegally it's just like how far can this go i mean what what is the end game i mean i tell people all the time drug pushers on the street are smart enough to keep their addicts alive so they have business but the the model that's been perpetuated for you know a long time now is actually really contributing to the destruction of humanity. I remember the British Medical Journal several years ago, maybe 10 years ago, produced an article, which I was amazed, got published, and showed that uh, uh, drug side effects and surgical blunders Medical care. were, were right. killing more people than any of the leading chronic diseases. Yeah, I think it's, it was third or fourth when that came out. Yeah, it was three. Cause of disease in the world. In the world, yeah, being caused or, by yeah the procedures, three or four million people a year it, dying from from malprescribed drugs and it surgical was like blunders. it was like three or four seven forty sevens crashing a day. Yes, I mean, would we not do something? Yes, uh, it's far more dangerous than COVID. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> it's 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 crazy oh. shit. But you know, I don't know. I mean, if you if you look at this from a spiritual perspective. I know when I sit with it, all I can see is that it creates an opportunity for people to have a choice to take responsibility for themselves. If you go to the doctor, you get your surgery, you get your pills, and you're getting worse, not better. If you stick with it, then you're, you're not an adult yet. You're still right. relying on a daddy figure or a mommy figure to tell you what to do. But when you re realize, okay, this isn't working, these drugs are making me worse, the surgery didn't help, right. then you have to step into your, your um, self-care shoes and say, okay, I got to go find someone that knows- Self-awareness. Yeah. I got to go find someone that knows how to deal with this. Yeah. It always shocks me when I see these, these come lately medical doctors mm -hmm. who had an autoimmune disease while they're in medical school. I, I can think of a couple and they wrote books about, right? Now they're their expert. Right. right, and I'm thinking, how did you go through medical school with this autoimmune disease, taking surgery on your thyroid, taking these drugs, and finally, somewhere down the line, in the last ten years, you you stumbled on that there's oh, there's a different way of doing this. Yes, what were you doing in medical school? Were yes. you looking at anything outside yeah. the little paradigm? Which brings up a little story about Paul Brenner. Mm -hmm. 
late in his career, he would go down to the medical school, the first year students, and give them a talk, right? And mm -hmm. see where they're at and, mm -hmm. you know, buddy up to them and, you know, tell them about the big world of integrative and holistic and the whole mind, body, spirit. And they were all like, yay. And he'd go back the fourth year to see him again. And they were like, where do we get the best rotation for the best job? Right. Right. They've been so trained in yeah. this narrow little path they could not even see the big picture anymore. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they can do it to you in the military in three years. So I guess yeah. four years <laughs> is enough time in the medical system. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that's, you know, kind of a concern these days for me and for many is all the 5G and now they're talking about mm -hmm. 6G phone systems. I'm just curious. What what do you think the impact of all that is going to be on the planet and on people's health? It's such a big unknown. Yeah. You know, I, I wish we could just say, well, let's take this little repeater thing off the area and put a plant in front of it and it dies so everybody could see it. Right. But it's so under the radar. So under the radar. Yeah, it, you know? it is the radar. <laughs> it's the new radar. That we don't know. I don't think, you know, yeah. we, we only have people who are studying it and- they're being squished. I mean, everything, anybody who comes out with information about what's going on is, yeah. is being censored. Yeah. So I wish I had a you know, better idea what it's going to do. I don't think it is being good. No. Um, I have a number of clients who they just put in smart meters mm -hmm. and they didn't even know they were in there. Yeah. And they were put in there and they had major issues flare up. Oh, yeah. I, you know, everything had... from Lyme flaring up to emotional. I mean, from a smart meter, that's yep. and that's like basically nothing. And that was just put in their apartment building. They had no idea it was there. Yeah, when when um, uh, a while back in the Vista House years ago, uh, they were they would give you a discount on your power right. if you have a smart meter. But I, you know, Penny handles all that stuff, and I didn't even know what it was, and I don't think she realized it was connected well, to five G. But then. I came across an article talking about smart meters and how they can cause a lot of health problems for people. And the smart meter was right next to Angie's bedroom, exactly. right out the window where the crib for and changing station was for Mana exactly. when he came. So I said to Penny, get rid of that thing. Call him up and tell him we don't want it because I just And then don't it's a hassle it. then do these things, oh, yeah, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, then, it, then it's an extra monthly fee and the yeah, problem, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's that. You know, the, the other thing I'm curious about is what's, what's, what is your feeling of the impact on all this censorship? What's the knock-on effect of so much censorship? Um, well, my introduction to it was when I was in chiropractic school, uh, 60 Minutes did a special on chiropractic. Mm -hmm. It was such a hit job. Right, and I love sixty minutes up to that time. Yes. Right. Oh, I, sixty minutes. Let's see what's happening in the yeah. world. Let's see. Oh, wow! Look at that, boy. After seeing what they did to chiropractic, oh. I mean, they just picked the the Looney Tunes out and made them like they were the main part of the profession. Mm. Right. Yeah. The hole in one. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, fortunately, when when we need a hole in one, yeah, they're good. <laughs> it does have its place. Yes. But anyhow, so that completely so that was 80 80 79 so was bill that, moyers in, in that gosh i'm surprised he would do that because he was I quite into he was in that holistic one. health yeah and he did that whole thing on uh acupuncture and yeah and went over all Zen the and all that china kind of he went over to yeah. china i've got that series in the library somewhere yeah. on vhs tape <laughs> <laughs> so funny my girlfriend's a philosophy professor and she's playing that for a class today is that right <laughs> yeah <laughs> Here we are was, talking about How's that for a small world? That's a but, but anyhow, I think it's been, so since that date, I've known it's been out there. But the last couple of years, it's been dramatically come to life. And I think more people are waking up to it. Yeah. Especially when there's life-saving, life-saving treatments, modalities that are inexpensive, highly effective yeah. out there. And the people are just censored. Yeah, I mean, not just censored; they they they're canceled. Yes, their jobs canceled. are canceled. Yeah, you know, I, uh, Dr. Gold. I mean, lost her job for just speaking out that hydroxychloroquine works, and we've got the studies, we've got the data. Yeah, and I mean, people so are, this is not about truth; it's not about no. science. That's one of the things that's really upset me about all this is that the real scientists of the world are not speaking out to let the public know this is not science. Yeah. You know, and I spoke to Irvin Laszlo on a podcast about this, 
And he patiently listened to me and he said, I must correct you. What you're referring to as scientists are not scientists. They're technologists who are impersonating scientists oh, to sell point. a product. Yeah. He said, you, you need to understand that no real scientist would behave that way because it's against everything science is about. He said, exactly. and paraphrase, science is the pursuit of the truth. And what is being pawned off as science is really technologists working for corporations, but the public doesn't know the difference. They don't. So it's and they're a, not allowed to know the difference. That's yeah, the, that's that's the incestuous even, fact. Yeah, yeah. So you you get all this censorship, and and you know it was interesting. I watched a quite a shocking documentary. Have you seen the documentary on Netflix called Social Dilemma? Yes. Right, and yeah. one of the one of the profound moments in that documentary is when one of the head programmers behind all this stuff, and I think he was from Google, if I remember right, said, "The problem is." we don't know the truth anymore. Nobody knows what the truth is. That's one of the outcomes of all of this right. kind of censorship and manipulation of information. And changing history. Yes. Right? They're just rewriting it. They're, yeah. And they just and they can erase a whole chapter. Yes. Yeah. And you have no, you can't even find it. It's like, it's like um, Google has become the CIA. Yeah. Redacted. Redacted completely. You're just a black line in a file if they don't want you around. <laughs> just like that. Yeah. And you don't even know who's pushing the button. No. It's, oh. it's uh, I don't know. Where, where do you think this, if you look into your crystal ball, where, where does this end up? Um, where I'm sitting right now, it's not looking good. No. You know, technocracy, yeah. the whole James Wood, all those people. Yeah. I, I think they're, they've kind of nailed it. Yeah, this, this is it's conglomerate scary. of these few powerful uh, yeah. organizations. It's uh, you know, having studied a lot on Bill Gates, that that's a very very dangerous situation. I noticed on Mercola this morning as an interview with a lady that uh, survived Nazi Germany, and it's all about her warning everybody that this is identical to what she identical. went through. Identical. Yeah. Yeah, they had a special on uh, was History Channel about World War Two. Well, they had the it included what led up to the Nazis. How did Hitler take control, yeah. right? And they show that well, it couldn't have happened in, in, except that they had the depression, right, mm. which made people desperate, right, for whatever came along, right. Oh, does that sound familiar? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now we have COVID. What? Yeah. A, a disease that's not even. I mean, a real where eighty-seven percent of people shouldn't disease. even been hurt. Yes. If they would have just scientists would have been able to get the medicine to the people. Yeah, and and handle it appropriately for what it is. How could politicians say you can't use this drug, that drug? Politicians. Yes. Yeah, that's... And how can Bill Gates control the whole medical system, the CDC, the World Health Organization, the media, the government? <laughs> I mean, the the fact that a Navy SEAL has not done their job with a threat to the world of that magnitude is beyond my mind. It's a, unbelievable. I had a dear friend, medical doctor, and he goes, right at the beginning, he goes, here, I'm giving you a script for hydroxychloroquine. You and Annie, got, you got to go fill it today because it may go away. And we're going, wait a minute. This, you know, just started. This can't be, come on. He says, you better fill it today. Wow. So we do. Two weeks later, it's, it's off the market. Yeah. What? How is that possible? It's used for rheumatoid arthritis, used around the world for malaria for yeah. many years. Politicians stopped it. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. You know, so... I mean, talk about ballsy. Well, yeah, <laughs> worse mean, than ballsy. It, it's... it's um, what do you... What's the right word? It's... Uh, it's it's a, a dark night of the soul. Oh, very. It's a collective dark night of the soul. Very. And... Um, and they keep on. Oh, and the thing that bothers the piss out of me is how freaking gullible people are. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm like, really? Are you I'm that driving up here to uneducated. people driving by with double masks in their car. Oh, I've seen people in hazmat suits. I've had friends. <laughs> one of my friends got on an airplane and texted me a picture of a woman on the airplane in a hazmat suit. He goes, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, oh, fucking God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, and not one word. And here's the here's the thing that's even 
more disturbing. There's not been one word about prevention, no. not one word about becoming healthy, no. not one word about getting vitamin D. I mean, I just looking through my pictures this morning, you know, before I came up here, and here's this picture from a year ago with all the walkways to the beach roped off by police tape. Yes, yeah. To the beach where you get sunshine and vitamin yeah. D, right? A friend of where mine you, got arrested for going on the beach. Oh, we got totally hassled. Yeah. We got run off by two cops on four wheelers yes. coming down the beach with full riot gear on yeah. coming down the beach we're sitting there taking some pictures yeah holy smokes yeah it's 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 bad uh you know our ceos in england he was telling me it's just radical over there there's oh, like yeah, a 1500 worse. pound fine if you get caught out after curfew <laughs> but you know it, it just goes to show you how powerful of a weapon fear is oh yes and it just reminds me of zig ziglar's acronym fear is false so evidence appearing real, real. And, yeah. that, and that's that's what disappoints me is people aren't like if someone tells me i've got to cage myself the first thing i'm going to do is say i need to make sure this is true yeah i'm going to look into this deeply and i spent a good 300 hours looking into this and the further i looked the more skunk smell i came across <laughs> it's just like okay <laughs> it's just this is like you know this is this is a this is a very dangerous situation but i try to always flip the coin on it and i think when i do that i see this is really an initiation process and it's the rite of passage into adulthood where we have to make choices for ourselves stand up for ourselves right. And, you know, there are places like the state of Florida, the governor has said- DeSantos has been amazing. Yes. Well, they just took him off of, I think, Facebook and Right, YouTube. for having, a, having a, what a, a meeting with top people, right? Yeah. The guy from the Barrington, uh, and then the, what's the other guy's name from Stanford? Those guys, interview with them. Yep. Why we need to have be open. And now they're blocking Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Oh, they are. You know, what, to 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 be to have the power to shut down senators like that, governors, that's serious shit. Yeah. You know, this is. And they don't. They don't. They're not saying, "Oh well, just well, oh whatever you say." No, they're just cutting them off. Yeah. Right. They're not even given any rationale. And for all it. they're talking about is why we be, should be open, <laughs> why the school should be open, why we should be free. Yes. Yeah. Whoa. And there's a. I think it's Bolivia. Uh, one of the countries like that said, no more COVID anything here. We're not doing this, period. The whole country just said, through, screw it. Yeah, and, and the reason Bolivia did that was because they used chlorine dioxide. Yeah. So that's the one Trump said, use a disinfectant, chlorine dioxide, right? Uh -huh. And they said, oh, it's bleach. No, you can't do, you can't go there. Well, they cured their country of COVID. Right. With what is it? Just use like a like a homeopathic dose or something? It's very small. It's like just drops in water. Yeah, yeah. Chlorine dioxide. It's amazing history. This guy Andreas Kalkar has written about it for 13, 15 years. It's an amazing substance. That's wild. Yeah. So there you go. Like, there's always a solution if you look for it. <laughs> yeah. But if you can't find it because it's being suppressed, that's the problem, you know, I... And talk about suppression, just on that same topic yeah. for a second. So Bolivia's cured themselves by using a substance that's been banned, and the FDA says it's horrible, but in their thing saying it's horrible, they say, we never studied it. Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, it's, but you can't do this. And, and here's another country, Ecuador, had 100 people, they're giving it to them, and doctors, you can go online and see the doctors there. Their pulse meter, you know, oxygen meter, yeah. is going down like a rock. They can barely breathe. They're about to intubate them. And they, and they check out and go get this therapy. They drink it. Their O2 comes up in real time. Wow. Comes up, up, up. hundred of them are cured. And so they're ready to institute it in the country because it's cheap. It's like pennies yeah. to do this. They're ready to institute it. World Banking Organization comes in and said, well, you got to do the mainstream Western world or you don't get your money. Oh, so Bolivia goes, well, we're poor. We don't need, we don't get their money anyhow. We'll use it. And they cured them. Right on. What the heck is going on with these people? I don't know. You know, it, it's, it's, um, it's time for human beings to decide what kind of world they want to live in and start yeah. taking responsibility for what we're creating together. Yeah. You know, you, you and I both know choosing not to choose is choosing. Right. So. When you get people fat, sick, tired, and addicted to media, they exactly. they don't do anything. 
No. And that seems to be part of the plan. And, and that that also is one of my questions for you, is which I'll just jump to now, and that is, what are some of the negative effects you've seen with so much overexposure to screens, be it at no. work, on computers, on phones? You know, I, I know there's a fair bit of science on this. I, I have some knowledge of my right. own, but I'm just curious, what's your take on yeah. all this overexposure to screens? I, You know, I think it's, uh, uh, I'll interject and just say that, you know, there's a beautiful saying, the mind makes a better tool than a master. And I think a computer screen and a phone make a better tool than a master. Right. So what do you think, and what have you seen happen when people become subservient to the yeah. screen? Which they've built into it, right? Yeah. It's so addictive. it's kind of like they did with food. Yeah. You know, they had people study food to make it addictive. Yes. Right? You can't stop at one chip. You got to yeah. get the bag. Yeah. Same thing with the video, same thing with the like button, same thing with the Facebooks, Instagram. They keep going back, 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 back. I mean, just look at all the neurosis. Look at the people online. Yeah. It's 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 pretty sad. People that don't even talk to each other, they just text each other and no. they're sitting right next to it's each right other. Right next to each other. If, if if anyone listening hasn't seen social dilemma, yeah. I'm amazed that's still up. I, I know multiple people who have broken up texting they don't even say to the person yeah we're done right yeah, i don't know what that is i mean it's almost as though people are turning into computer chips uh digital I, processors it's it, zero or one on or off they've completely lost social engagement skills yeah and you can see that i mean yeah. you go to a restaurant people are like nobody's looking at each other I, and i used to comment on this years ago when it first started when we were in australia one time we got out of a class and it was like late and we're Going down, it was, I can't remember, it was probably in Sydney or one of those areas, mm -hmm. but one of the main, in the town. And, we, and we're going out, and as soon as we walk out of the room, they're going to take me to dinner. They're all in their devices. That's before we had texting. Mm -hmm. So in the U.S., texting came late. Yeah. Over there, they, they, they were on it. Well, Australia is a test center for Microsoft, so they have technologies way before we They do. were totally on So we're walking down the street, and they're texting. I'm going, Wait a minute! What just happened to our connection? Yeah, we're in this classroom, we're one to one. We're communicating. It's a it's a duality. Where it's a yeah. feedback loop, yeah. right? We're yeah. socially engaged. Yeah, you walked out there and like this, and it, it just vaporized. Oh. Right, the energy, everything just went. So it's that not. led me early on that this texting, this video, is not helping people come together. It's not helping us be safe. It's not mm. helping us be well. No. So what I saw in my clients was people would come to me with ADD issues with their children. Yeah. So the first thing I'd go is, well, we're treating you, not the kid, yeah. to start off. We're right. We're make sure you got your act together. Yeah. You're and the main influence. Exactly. So as soon as I got that part straightened out, the next part was, are they online? Are they on videos? Are they watching games? Sure enough, they were. Okay, we got canceled out. And the feedback from everybody who did that mm -hmm. was, oh, my ADD child, who was like violent and acting out and taking baseball bat to people, is now, 10 years later, making videos actually creative. Yeah. You know, they were able to be this singular, focused, non communicating person to being engaged. Yeah. Because they weren't being singularly focused um fahimi wrote a wonderful book uh, open focus brain yes i've i've right? you, you turned me onto that and i've practiced that and use it with my clients and i do it myself it's quite good exactly and he's talking about if we're narrowly objectively focused yeah which is we're doing on a video screen yeah we're we're very stressing our system out mm -hmm. narrow objective versus being deeply immersed in the moment right mm -hmm. diffusely immersed yeah which is in, in polyvagal, they like to use the term staring or gazing. Right. So I'm going to just say to our client, you know, our listeners, <laughs> just take a little time out and just stare at something or someone or mm. pretend somebody's staring it's at you. It's tiring. And notice what happens to your system. Mm. Feel what happens. You get tense. You get yeah. stressed out. Mm -hmm. then, then do a gaze. Yeah. Somebody's gazing at you. You're gazing. I would just use the word. I relax. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I soften. And he talks about that as being diffusely immersed yes. i used the example of oh you're fly fishing you don't even know where time goes right right yeah you know when you're staring at something you know like if somebody's going to hit you or there's a threat then you have very intense focus and i yeah. think 
that the brain circuits don't know the difference between staring at a video game and staring no, they, at a lion that's no, caught out of its cage. Sympathetic activation unsafe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's full on adrenaline. Boom, boom, mm-hmm. boom, boom, boom. I have a dear friend. I went up to his house years ago, fellow chiropractor. And I go in his house and he has two kids. I don't know him well. I go in and his kids in this big screen TV won't come out, won't talk, totally incoherent, can't speak to me. And he's doing this video war game with people online in some other place. They're not with him, yeah. right? So they're not even together. Wow, I'm going, how dysfunctional is this? He can't even come out and greet me. He can't, there's no social engagement at all. Right. He's totally locked in this war game. I'm thinking, wow, what's going to happen to this person? Yeah. He's a Navy SEAL now. Oh. The only thing he could do. Wow. Because yeah. he was so focused. Yeah, well, and there you have it. Yeah. The... Uh, the uh, sperm has found its egg, and that's the outcropping of it all. It's uh, it's a very um, odd thing. I never imagined I'd see this in my lifetime. Right, I totally agree. You know, it's it's, it's almost we, we, like we used to use the term in our didn't we use to use the term uh, nature? What is that? Uh, deprivation syndrome, uh-huh. DRP, or something, mm-hmm. something like that. You know, yeah. deprived from nature. Yes. Boy, that was back then. Nature deficit. Yeah, de- na- nature deficit disorder. Yes. Yeah. That was then. Now it's like a thousand times worse. You can't even go in nature. Yeah, right? that's the other thing that I've heard. There, uh, My buddy, uh, Ben Stewart, who has a show called Waking Infinity, which is very good, mm-hmm. and he's a regular contributor to Gaia TV, he says that he's seen documents showing that they're, they're actually – Part of the whole plan with COVID is to uh, actually make it illegal to be in nature, and you can only use um, virtual, like oh. glasses and stuff, to go into nature. And their claim is they're protecting nature from destruction. Oh my gosh! And I, I'm like, I can see that. I can see. Uh, it. You know, they, they, uh, th- that would be a great idea if there was any evidence that they were interested in protecting anything <laughs> that doesn't make them shitloads of money. I mean, if they were interested in protecting people, then they would have been protecting people from bogus medicine and bogus science and bogus politics and bogus military activity. So, you know, how do you trust pathological liars? I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? No. And and the paradox is how do you, how do you, how do you deal with a world where most politicians with the exception of people like robert f kennedy jr and and the senator of florida the governor of florida are clearly pathological people i mean you know the day that donald trump got voted into president i'm i i said to angie and penny this is a very very dangerous situation because we've got a a d-grade actor who's been bankrupt like three times and is notoriously known to be uh, connected to criminal activity, who's now the president of the United States. I mean, Ronald Reagan was bad enough, but then you, you get this, and now I don't know what we've got now. It's it's just another uh It's kind of a puppet. front. It's a puppet for the corporation. Yeah, it's a corporate puppet. High tech. It's, uh, it's pretty wild. Ugh. Hi, everybody. I imagine some of you are finding that your mind is not as sharp as it was, or that you can't seem to remember things as well, such as the last page you read in a book, or the key points from a meeting you just attended recently. Do you feel that your brain is taking longer to come online, or that your thinking gets muddled or fuzzy when you've got a lot to get done? If so, Organifi Pure may be just the magic you need. A key ingredient in Organifi Pure, called Neurofactor, showed a significant impact on brain-derived neurotropic factor, which has been widely reported to play a critical role in neuronal development, maintenance, repair, and protection against neurodegeneration. The certified organic combination of herbs in Organifi Pure not only enhances mental clarity and promotes brain-derived neurotropic factor to stimulate the development of new neural pathways, It aids in enhanced digestion, which is important because many cognitive problems are symptoms of poor digestion. To get your Organifi Pure and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and save 20% on any of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K20, that's CHECK20, during discount. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. 
I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers, which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wade, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes magnesium breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combine them without any weird excipients or, you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy by Optimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it and what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living40 and put in your coupon code Paul10 and you get a 10% discount. And of course, everything has a 100% money back guarantee. You can't get better than that. Enjoy. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And... You're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Shervin Jaffariah, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Sheila J Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their Biocharge Activated Coconut Charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their Organic Longevity Formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis Liposomal Glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. You know, the other question I'd like to ask you is because I know you spend a lot of time in nature and have a deep connection to nature, you know... We, we really are on the edge of, of uh, you know, I, th- I tell people in podcasts all the time, the whole COVID thing is a, is a, a, a pimple on an elephant's ass compared to the state of nature right now. And that we're focusing on the wrong things. What's your, what's your thoughts? If you put your finger on Mother Nature's pulse, what's the uh, reading? And where, where, are we, where are we at? What's going to happen if we don't start cleaning it up? It's unbelievable that we're not cleaning it up. That is a right? shock. I mean... I say we should uh, task our militaries immediately with that. I, I mean, it, it, I, I'm not sure about the debate about global warming or cooling or changing or yeah. man's influence on it, but whatever that debate is, and that's another one that's been canceled. Yeah. You can't debate that. Yeah. Um, but as far as cleaning up the environment, yes. that's a non-debate. No, it's not um, a debate. It's, and it's now I have... Straight up needed. I have dozens of pictures of this mass debacle in the environment. Supposedly there's a billion masks made a day in the world, some crazy number. Mass of what? Masks. Oh, masks. masks. Oh, yeah. And oh, they're, they're showing they've... up in the environment? Oh, my gosh. There's some island supposedly off, I think it's Australia, where they measure pollution in the ocean. So stuff drift off to this island. Yeah. No, nobody lives on it, but they... It's now being filled up with masks. Oh my God! And I and just just I, I'm a beach person. I go to the beach every day. Yeah. And it's a great beach, wind and sea beach down mm, La Jolla. One of my favorites. Exactly. <laughs> You'll like the pictures in the new book. Right. <laughs> but uh, but anyhow, there's masks everywhere. You know, it's in this going into the ocean on the beach. They're everywhere. So here we are. You know, this pandemic, and we call talk about collateral damage. Yes. Holy moly, this thing's going, and we're just starting to see that. Yeah, and, and 
uh, I saw a, a documentary 10 years ago showing there was a, a mountain of garbage in the Pacific Ocean the right. size of Texas. Right. And, and, and it's now, mainly plasticizers, right? Yes. And, yep. and now we have, uh, I've seen reports from scientists saying that we are now in a very dangerous situation because there's so many um, satellites that have burned out floating around our, our orbit that they could come spontaneously Crush. crashing yeah. down. And, and they say we're, we're, we've done a very good job of filling space with junk as well. And then there's, I don't know what the estimate on rockets for, for 5G is, like 26,000 5G satellites. I mean, what the hell? I think that's a minimum for what I, what I heard. Jesus, right? it's unbelievable. And it's all because they want to be able to control remote control cars and right. and robotics and or, or self-driven cars and robotics right. with which need high-speed control. You know, obviously, yeah. you can't have slow speeds on an internet lag if you're running a, a train or a... <laughs> Car, a car, or anything driverless else. cars, yeah, yeah, or no, no. It's I mean, cleaning up the environment is imperative, and it's not happening. I mean, yeah. you see occasionally somebody comes up with some way to, you know, clean up this big part you're talking about in the Pacific. Yes, you know, somebody came up with some way of rounding it up. Some kid actually, mm -hmm. and it seems to be effective mm -hmm. and workable. And then other ones, a, a biological. Like a bacteria that eats plastic. Yes, I've heard about that. That's um, fantastic. And once they'll go in and like where old gas stations were, and they all leaked, and they have a bacterium or that'll go in and chew up the yes. old residue. Yes. So there's been invading innovative things yeah. going on, but overall it's been minimal. But they're not being taken up by the big corporations oh, no. that are making the messes. No. You know, and one of the nice things is the shift away from plastic bags I've seen, at least in this area. I know now Penny gets degradable bags when right. she goes shopping and things like that. So it's nice to see some small changes at yeah. least, but, uh, you I know. The, I think the big one that hit our area, well, California in general, recycling. Yeah. But where does it go? I goes don't. to China. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> So it can end up being more it's masks. It floats back. <laughs> yeah, it floats back. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it's, oh. I don't know, you know, it, it's, um, you know, the vision that I get when I think about this is, you ever seen the movie Mad Max? God, a long time it's ago. It's a long time ago. It's yeah. a sci-fi movie, but the earth is just, da, da, da. yeah, Mel yeah. Gibson, it's, the earth is just barren, right? Right. It's kind of like uh, some of these movies where if you go outside like, uh, what is it, Hunger Games, if you go outside the controlled area, right, right. everything's just kind of desolate, you know? Yeah. And uh, I mean, talk about pollution. Yeah. So here we have green energy, but is it really non-polluting energy? I, I, I mean, when they first did the first windmill on the road out by Palm Springs. Right. Right? Oh, wow, what a great photo op. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now I go out there and they're all rusted. They're oh. Half of them falling apart. Is and they're right? not working. Oh, oh it's, it's so ugly. That's sad. Oh, and the amount of birds that get killed by them. And, oh, man. It's, it's a, it looks like a graveyard. One of the things Ibrahim Karim brought up, too, which is people are totally clueless about, is that there's a huge amount of electromagnetic pollution in electric cars. Oh. And so he's developed technology that people can buy to put into their electric cars to turn it into converted. You're sitting on a battery, right? With yeah. A, it's running around well, you. Well, not only that, you're, you're, you're next to usually motors? four engines, right? right? There's an engine on each wheel. Right. If they're four-wheel drive, right. like a lot of the Teslas, I think, are four-wheel drive. Um so you're talking about a very high-powered electric motor that's producing massive electromagnetic fields. Massive. So it, that's got to be very bad news, not only for, for the brain be. and the nervous system, but our subtle energy fields are interfacing with progressively lower levels, right? You, right. you, 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 you However you want to break it down, causal, mental, astral, etheric, right. glandular, hormonal, physical. So these... Uh, some of the experts that I've seen, I was just watching a show on Gaia TV where they were saying that uh, the it's inconclusive, but the experts were saying it may be scientifically inconclusive, but we can pretty much tell you that it's causing huge problems in people's bodies because it's narrowing the frequency band that we communicate with nature yeah. and, and the universe down because it's blocking key frequencies with things like destructive interference. Right. right. So it's... It's uh, kind of a... And they're outlawing 
gas operating cars in the state of California, right? By, oh, is that right? I think it's by 35. And I, you know, oh. That's coming right up. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's all going to be electric vehicles. Yeah, well, you and, know. And people don't know about the BG3 technology, right? No, they don't. So it's like, wow. It's almost like we have created, uh, you know, you remember how in the days of the gladiators in the Coliseum, they had all the doors and a lion might come out of one and a right. somebody wanting to kill you would come out of another. It's like we've surrounded ourselves with these doors, yeah, all of which analogy. have monsters yeah. coming out. And it's the question is, who can survive the gladiator pit? Yeah. And, and, you know, people seem very oblivious to the fact, like I can tell you of a problem that I've been having. I can't, there's hardly anything I can eat now because my body hates corn and grains. It always has. And almost every chicken, turkey, duck, anything that I eat, they're feeding these things. That. They're yeah. raised on So I get the same reaction as if I was eating gluten containing grains. grains and yeah. I'm, I've gotten to the point now where Penny's like, well, I don't know what to feed you anymore. So I'm, uh, the only thing I can eat is ocean caught fish and, and vegetables. And, it's like a trippy experience I'm having because everywhere I go to try to find animals that were not fed grains, they're, they're just even some of the so-called high-end organic free-range ones are still finishing them off with, with grains. grains. Yeah, fatten them up. <laughs> yeah. It, so uh, that might you might be able to shed some light on this. I mean, I know that whatever an animal eats and metabolizes becomes part of its flesh, but have you ever got any concepts on how the corn is actually making it into the flesh of the animal yeah. to become a, 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 an immune stimulant or reactive yeah. food. It's been a long time since I looked at that, but I do recall um, looking significantly at what happens to the fats in an animal uh -huh. after they eat corn. Right. So they end up with corn oil. Right. Right. They okay. don't end up with saturated fats. Their percentage of the unsaturated corn oil goes up. Uh, yeah. And the ALA and, it, and all those, the yes. omega sixes, yes. goes up dramatically. Right. Like somewhere, so. somewhere in the 20 plus percent. Yeah. Which is from about a couple percent to a significant amount. Yes. So somehow, though, the, the, the protein fraction must be making it into the food because I don't, yes, I do get reactions from oils. But not like I get if I eat the grain because, you know, gluten's the protein right. fraction. Somehow the grain protein is somehow getting incorporated into the flesh of these animals. And I, I haven't made an attempt to really research it. And I yeah. probably could find the answer. I was just curious if you had any ideas no, on that. I, I, I mean... You look at portamorphogens, you know, that's very Pro, yeah, popular. Now yeah. they have ancestral grass-fed from New Zealand, yeah. and they have the liver and the intestine. Mm -hmm. and, well, the whole concept of portamorphogens in, uh, who was that, Jeffrey Bland. Jeffrey Bland, he yeah. He wrote a whole book about portamorphogens. He said like 5 to 7% actually ends up in the gland that you're eating or in the muscle yes, or in the brain. Yeah, or yeah. That's a high percentage. It is, yeah. So if you think of it that way and the building block of whatever you're eating, yes. there's got to be a residual yeah. print right? yeah, exactly. within it, even if it's just energetic. Yeah, I think it might be as much energetic as it is actual structural um, because my understanding of the digestive system is it breaks things down to the essential building blocks, amino acids, fats, and carbohydrates and then rebuilds the body out of it but right. you know it's there's must be some research showing how protein from grains is actually being incorporated into the muscle structure right. and because the body uses these building blocks somehow the immune system is at least mine's not buying it yeah. it's saying well, no the other, yeah the other side of that too is the old leaky gut one yes right and so who doesn't hardly have that just for right. stress? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So if we're having any sort of leaky gut, whatever that molecule is, it's not being totally broken down because we don't absorb singular amino acids. You know, we get peptides. Right. Groupings of them. Mm -hmm. So those groupings are crossing the barriers. Yes. So depending on how many yeah. is going to impact where it's going, where does it sit, how is yeah. it being built up? Yeah. One of the things that's been helpful to me uh, is – by optimizers leaky gut guardian formula which they spent a lot of time energy and efforts to do a lot of scientific research on 
but uh, they they develop this product that actually helps heal the gut wall. And I've found it to be every patient I've given it to has said yeah. it's been beneficial. And um, while I'm thinking about it, you mentioned your new book. Where can people find your new book, which is your book of beautiful photography? Yeah, um, on the website, of course. <laughs> okay, which is centerforbalance.net? Uh, that's my office one. So, okay. Yeah, so centerforbalance.net or cliffoliver.com. Cliffoliver.com? Yeah. Okay. Um, but that's my office links to that. Okay. Um, but my passion... Yes, you know my creative passion yes. side is surf photography and the beach, and uh, it's uh, the latest one is my tenth one. Yes, and it's uh, the art of surfing. Oh, great! And it's on my website for surfing, which is surfphotolahoya dot com. Oh, okay. So you got multiple websites. You're yeah, as bad oh, as yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> I can hardly remember all my websites. <laughs> I, I don't know the passwords, but no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't either. <laughs> Fortunately, Penny can remember every number. Uh, I don't know how she does it. She can remember all of our credit cards, the <laughs> passcodes to locks. I mean, uh, oh, inside Penny's brain is something that is not in my brain. <laughs> But uh, thank God it's there. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is you know, you've, you've really been around in this profession long enough to really see what we call functional medicine really come into existence and go through many changes. In fact, I have to use you when I get reports because you're the one that knows how to calculate all these other models because right. there's they you know they they all use different reference scales so right. i often have to send you r lab reports and say what the freaking hell does this mean because it sure is not the one i was trained to use right. you know i went through dr timmon's system as you know exactly but a lot of them are using rating scales that i don't even recognize so it's just like gobbledygook so i have to get you yeah. to <laughs> translate and, and they're changing you know the, the scales yeah especially when you get them from like Australia or whatever, they completely use a different yes, scale, yeah. which makes it even more confusing. Yes. But even even within Quest, I just got a lab yesterday from Quest, and they, they're using a different readout on the WBC. I was like, wait oh, a minute. Oh, white blood cell count? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the breakdown neutrophils and yeah. that. I was like, whoa, where did that one come from? But yeah, so they, they're evolving, you know, constantly. So my question is, what do you see as the future trends? Like, where is it going? Is it good? Is it is there, are the tests getting more reliable or are they just manufacturing more shit to sell more tests or right. what's the what's the uh, what's the uh, status and, and the future yeah I think there's two different sides to it one of them is the insurance driven side yeah and so we used to order a smack 24 that's just all the chemistries you know the co2 magnesium and insurance won't let you do that anymore what so now you can only get a few things on there that might relate to a diagnosis. So oh. it's all related to a diagnosis. Right. And that's Medicare is what drove that. Oh, thank so you. it would cost you for this back like $12 or something. It was like dirt cheap. Now that's too much. So you can only order some aspects of it. Oh. So we just had another test just the other day. Somebody with a goiter in Oregon and the guy won't order an antibody test on her thyroid. What? What's he? Well, the insurance probably <laughs> won't cover it. Yeah, but at least the patient should have the right to say, "I better pay for it." Well, myself. so they're going to pay, you know, so they're going to pay me to do a cash price to order this test, right? But it's amazing. But that's insurance driven, so that's that side of it. Yeah. So they're making the test less and less testing, so you don't get anything outside of the, that diagnosis. Which means you can't put the picture together. Exactly. So which you, means you, you get miss, drugs <laughs> and you miss all sorts of things. Yes. Right. Like yeah. antibodies. Yes. You know, like autoimmune disease, like yes. all sorts of things. You miss all this stuff. Yeah. The other side of it is functional medicine. I think has really gotten a lot more accurate. Yeah. Good. Um, there's a lot of competition in the field, so labs are driving each other mm -hmm. to be better and better. Um, so in that sense, you know, the Genova's doctor's data is the diagnostics, the one Bill Tim has helped. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they're getting better. I think they're getting okay. broader in their approach. That's the good. information's better. They're not getting particularly cheaper, but they are getting cheaper. Okay, so good. So prices are being driven down. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I'm pretty impressed in functional medicine, what's happening mm -hmm. in general. Um, as far as relating to what happens with the client, it's the same old thing. Yeah. I, 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 I remembered a thing I was, uh, just came to me. I remember early on in my career mentioning, I, I think it was in our classes, you know, when we first started teaching, I'd tell people, you know, when I talk to somebody in person or on the phone, but particularly on the phone, 
I can tell so much about how we're going to get along, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not what they're saying, it's how they're saying it, Yeah, right? I can tell if they're not going to be on the program, right. they're not going to get dive in, and yeah. they're, they're not going to when do When you hear this. things like, I have to do that? <laughs> yeah. I got to fill out all this paperwork? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, the paperwork comes back like, you know, the story of yeah. misspell their own name three yeah. different times, yeah. whatever. But that, that whole concept of what tests are applicable, right? Yeah. And what are they going to get out of it? And is it worth them spending the money to do that? Right. So I think that's part of the art of medicine, mm -hmm. right? What testing is going to help that person mm -hmm. get to where they want to be? Yeah. So determining that. But I think overall, testing prices have gone down in general. Results have gotten better. Still controversial. People are still upset about certain mold tests. And, you know, some people think the shoemakers of the world on molds are, you know, not the right path. And there's always going to be that controversy. So mm -hmm. that's partly up to the practitioner to try and figure it out, mm -hmm. you know. Um, is one of the things that I saw that I didn't like in my years doing functional medicine is that it was really just becoming another path to allopathic yeah. medicine but now it might be hormone supplements and and things that are packaged but they're there it's like a this for that approach oh yeah yeah no absolutely is it still is there is it moving more toward a holistic orientation or is it still just uh unless you're someone like you that has that knowledge are they right. still just becoming more doctors in white coats with all this stuff. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Is yeah. I don't I don't know if they want to become the doctors in white coats or what yeah. it is, but they get their results back and they all usually not all labs, but they come back with, oh, here's the menu of therapies. Right. Right. And usually it's a supplement. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Some of the labs come back and they say, well, you gotta change your diet, mm -hmm. you know, you need more exercise, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's in there. Is it used? Hardly. Yeah. It's usually supplements, right? right? Same as supplement kind of thing, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but that's common. But that's, again, not really getting the patient on board to realize it takes more than popping a pill. Yeah. Right? It, it does. the old analogy in your book with the holes in the boat, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's still applicable. <laughs> you, you've got gold nails and junk wood. <laughs> junk wood. Yeah. What? Uh, I'm curious, what's your thoughts with regard to the percentage of disease coming from bad food. I mean, just food based as, as an etiology. Yeah. Um, if we go back to analogy, you know, we used a few minutes ago about 43% of the people are going to be diabetic, the ones who were born in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. Well, what's driving the diabetes? It's the food. Yeah. Right. It's the diet. Yeah. So we have two things with food, really. We have, Choice, quality, right, and quantity. Yeah. So what's happening with people's choices, quality? Yeah. Poor. Yeah. Isn't getting better. What's happening with their, how their eating style, quantity, speed, eating, all that kind of stuff? More. More. Because there's no nutrition, so they stay hungry. Yeah. So if somebody would could address that, yeah, I think you would have tremendous results yeah. in changing what's happening with the person. But again, it goes back to, Quality and quantity. What do you think's driving the recent sort of uh, vegan craze and vegetarian craze? I mean, is it starting again? No. Uh, <laughs> so we went through that in the eighties, right? Yeah, <laughs> I know. We but had the you know, McDougals it, of the world. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger produced that movie. I forgot the name of it, or I don't know if he produced it, but he was in it. Um, I can't remember the title of it, but there's been a quite a lot of of real push out there towards vegan and vegetarianism and, and back by the concept that uh, cattle farming is raising the greenhouse effect yeah. that's bad for the environment. Well, all, of course, which is based on completely a false premise, right. uh, which is basically saying Mother Nature doesn't know what she's doing. I mean, if, we all know corporate farming is a bad idea, yeah. but they're also <laughs> saying that, that the free-range animals need to go, and, yeah. and then it goes right to Bill Gates, who's trying to completely push meat out of the market, well, shut well, down look farming. At the, the new hamburger or whatever it is, right? The new, I, I don't even know the name of it now because there's a bunch of them out there. Yeah. But it's just, it's a fake food. It's fake food. It's soy based and it's also GMO. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's poison. And, and, and people are like going for it because they've made the narrative, right? What's the little story? Tell a lie long enough. Yeah, they believe it. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's so bad for the environment having cattle on the free range 
that we have to have this substitute. And the substitute, oh, it's not animal-based. Did anybody look what's in it? Yeah. No. No. It's it's uh, and it's and it's skyrocketing. Yeah. So if you say you know we're saying the reemergence of vegetarianism and that's what they're doing it on. Yeah. Boy, that's, that's just that's a, a death sentence. A death. Oh, it's terrible. It's almost as though that if you take the steps backward, when you look at the things we've been talking about, from polluting the environment to masking people to uh, the medical mafia stopping people from really understanding right. holistic health to the uh, allowing the food processing industry to poison people to the the all the things we're talking about it's almost as though there's a long term plan to pretty much well i i interviewed dr minkoff do you know dr minkoff the inventor of metal free oh, no i oh. didn't know he was the inventor of it yeah he is yeah. and it, i had okay. a phenomenal interview with him but he he was saying that in 19 in the 1960s he was invited to some meeting or something. I can't remember the exact details, but it was all about eugenics. Oh, yeah. And he said that they were sharing this plan about how they were going to selectively wipe out key races right. and people on the world to do basically what Hitler was doing, which is to only keep the people that they want on the planet. Right. He said at that time, uh, which I think was in the 60s, he said they were trying to uh, keep the world population down to 3 billion that's a big cut. <laughs> well, you know, when I was in college, the mantra of the day was ZPG, zero population growth. Right. right? Don't have kids. Yeah. Right? That was it. But it didn't well, work. Well, who started China? that? Probably. Right? Oh, no. So it's, it's like it's the college students of the, oh, of okay. the U.S. who get, get the message, right? Okay, yeah. But who's, who's, who's saying that, right? I don't know. But that's part of that model, right? Yeah. The eugenics model, stop the population growth. Because I saw a documentary not too long ago that showed that the population rise is slowing a lot because people are so infertile, they're not having kids. Well, that too. And the population's now an aging population, so there's just less people in the age of their youthful right. fertility. So, But they were showing us a lot of st statistics on population growth that were once causing so much fear and alarm are actually showing to be wrong because of all the things that are happening and all the infertility right. that's happening. Well, we used to talk about... What was it in Scotland? The fertility rate of males went down fifty percent. Their active sperms couldn't swim, right? Because there was so many birth control pills in the water, right? You know, residue, right? Yep, yep. And plastic. And that, that was what fifteen years ago in Scotland. Yes, it's not gotten better. No, no, it's it's some weird shit. But anyhow, my whole plan point was: it seems as though there's a plan to just really do everything to reduce the population. But the point is, is by the time they get it done, what's going to be left of the world for the people that do stay around? And what in the world are they going to do to clean a mess up that's going to be of that magnitude? You know, this well, is not something that's going to happen overnight, this whole population well, thing. Well, Dr. Klinghart's got his weekly, you know, updates for the COVID year, for this uh -huh. year. It's been great. But he's so upset worried and upset about the aluminum you know the yes what's going on with these and contrails bill right? gates is behind that too and then he's got his whole new one coming up where they're going to block the sun yes what is what's what they have no idea what they're doing no they don't and they don't understand anything to do with integration and holism and Bill Gates is the last one I heard. He's going to spray chalk dust in right, massive right. quantities. I'm like, oh, that's just going to be fucking great. Mm -hmm. We're going to be breathing chalk. The world's going to be covered in chalk. It's like, oh, um, now we're going to have lung diseases like crazy. <laughs> I mean, aluminum's now being implicated in all sorts of things, from yes. Alzheimer's to mm -hmm. you know, chronic diseases of all sorts. Yeah, where did we ever get that before? You know, aluminum in the sky. I, I, this, who dreams this stuff up? This is like, uh, you know, your expert comment, but I, I, tell, I tell people, students, I say the world is now dangerously full of very smart, stupid people. Yeah. That's, you know, that's a good one. Smart enough to figure out how to get aluminum to fill the sky, but too dumb to see what they're doing. <laughs> You're right. You know, smart enough to build robotics and nanotechnologies and 5G systems, but not paying attention to the fact that you're going to destroy your own family with that shit. Right. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, you know, you're a musician and you and I 
used to do a lot of uh, sound healings as part of our, right, our healing right. work in our training for HLC practitioners. How do you see music? Um, is it is it coming into medicine? Is it coming into holistic circles more, or or are we still blind to the power of music for healing? Yeah, I, I saw probably in the nineties. Um, Goldman and there's a couple really good people who really were doing that. Work. Yeah, they were bringing it in. There was a hospital in what in Denver, I think it was, mm -hmm. that soundscaped every part of the hospital. Neat, right from the recovery room to the emergency room. It was amazing. Um, but I can tell you, I, I I don't see it continuing. I think it's kind of faded away. That's sad. Um, which is sad. I mean, there's a few individual pockets of people yeah. doing it. Um, Victor Wooten's, I mentioned earlier to you, Victor Wooten's new book uh, about the spirit of music. Right. I think it's a powerful book. And in there, he gives a nice little example of if we took music as we would hear it, as we played it, yeah. and we measured on a scale, a 12-inch scale, that would be the full 12 inches. And then if we put it into a CD, it's now like, two inches oh because uh, of the compression yeah, and loss of exactly. overtones and, and the overtones and right? plus digital music and is then, very different and then you put it into a phone yeah we're down to a quarter of an inch yeah right i don't like digital i like you know i I, can, I still have my cd player because it's a digital analog converter yeah so it still sounds a lot better like i can plug my phone in and play you exactly the same music on a cd and it sounds flat exactly it sounds like you know the difference would be if I painted a picture of you versus standing here looking at you. Right, right, you know? exactly. So he mentions in the book that there's a doctor in upstate New York who's measured the effect of this lessened music on people and it weakens them. Yeah. Or he says he's a stress doctor. Well, I know it's John Diamond oh, because he tested 20,000 different recordings on people using his you know, behavioral kinesiology. Right. And I'm going, holy smokes. So there's somebody out of Colorado who invented digital in the first place who's come out with a way of having it a full wave. Oh, great. Yeah. And in fact, I invested in a company, one of my <laughs> more recent investments that's bringing into the whole soundscape coming back. And you sit in this room and you listen to it and it blows your socks off. That's great. So it's 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 happening, but it's off in the distance. Mm -hmm. But it weakens you to mm -hmm. listen to stuff on like a, a phone, which is everybody's doing. Yes. The music doesn't have the full spectrum, doesn't have the overtones, doesn't have the healing qualities. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like wearing sunglasses in the sun. <laughs> you just lost a lot of it. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, but music is healing. And my thing is, it's good for you when you can listen to it. And it's better if you listen to real music, mm -hmm. you know, in person. But it's better it, if you play which, it. <laughs> which is another thing they stopped, right? Yeah. It was shut down. People were shut down from gathering for music. Yeah. And then the best one of all is to actually play it. Yeah. And I think everybody should be playing music. Yeah. Right? Everybody. I'm fortunate. Native American flute, whatever it Drum, is, whatever. Drum. Yeah, my, my kids love it. Zoe loves to play the piano. And yeah. so we go and play and... and uh, that's something I need to do more of. You know, we get in there maybe once or twice a week, but I want right. to step that up for the kids. Uh, a couple years ago, I guess about four or five years ago, a friend gave me a ukulele. Mm -hmm. So I played guitar most of my life. Um, used to take one on her travels with us and stuff in the flute. But this ukulele is so simple. Yeah. It's so easy. So I started going to meetups. There's meetups everywhere. Of course, mm -hmm. not for the last year, but looking forward, mainly older people sitting there all strum 80 people strumming away yeah just gathering on with music playing of the music it's great yeah um interestingly i learned from aubrey marcus when i was last in austin doing a podcast with him he said that there's a permit you can get for i can't remember the name of it it's something protest but it's it's you you basically get a permit to have a protest hmm. and you don't you, then you you can actually have gatherings and it's legal. Well, I don't know. In Ca we're talking about California. I don't know about California, but I know that maybe in Texas. In, in well, Texas, Texas is open, so they're yeah okay, they're so they're it, they're so. they're free now. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, this, Florida, right? Yeah, this was a this was when it wasn't open, but uh, there was a name of this 
but uh, he said that people were buying these permits to protest oh, yeah, and just having yeah. huge parties and yeah. dancing and singing and saying, screw, screw it, man, we're just going to go for it. And, and, and it was legal because they were supposed to be doing a protest. protest. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, we had a, a, a gentleman we know, he's a real, pretty famous surfer. He had a, somebody made a movie of him and he decided to show it to, to his friends. So he rented one of these pop-up movie screens yeah. and had it at the Wind and Sea Beach. This is last August, right in the middle of the shutdown, right? Uh huh. Hundreds of people just swore. That's fantastic. Things. People were going, oh, the traditional, you know, the regular people, like, oh, this is so dangerous. Yeah, yeah, dangerous. <laughs> I've I've really been grateful that the people around here have not shown any indication whatsoever that they have anything fear of all this yeah. crap i haven't seen anyone wearing masks people were the neighbors are on their app saying come on over have a drink we're not playing this well, stupid game so i i feel fortunate that where we live is an enlightened community no you're right i mean i live in a fantastic area i mean wealthy area but they they bit from the apple jesus yeah. oh man but they didn't get the knowledge of good and evil they just no. got sucked into the sucked evil in yeah yeah it's uh Trippy shit. Um, Elementary schools, jumping jacks with masks on. Yeah. I can't get it what out of my get? mind. Yeah, it's, a, it's almost like you're seeing the beginnings of a worldwide prison camp. Yeah. With invisible walls. I, exactly. And, and what we used to teach in walking workshop, I used to teach no professional team has people doing jumping jacks mm -hmm. because it, it throws the brain communication off. Mm -hmm. Not do crossing the middle. There's no crossing paths. Mm -hmm. Here are these little kids out there. I'm sure they're going to wear the same mask all day. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's horrifying. Uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask your opinion on, just because you've been around and experienced and seen a lot of stuff, what do you feel, like right now, there's a lot of resurgence of research on psychedelics. Uh, you know, and Colorado's now made it legal to have mushrooms, and I think a couple of other states have as well. Uh, they decriminalized them. As you know, marijuana is now legal all sorts of places, and they're redoing, uh, res they're now starting to allow research on LSD. I saw a phenomenal, um, the, Psy the Psychedelica 2 series is now out on Gaia, which is produced by my buddy Ben Stewart, and it's freaking excellent. And he showed a recent study out of a major university. I don't think it was in the U.S. I think it was somewhere like Finland or somewhere over there, Norway or something like that. But right. they they did some very cool research using a certain type of math that converts all the brain waves into harmonics. And they showed that there's a harmonic structure to the brain right. and that when people were put on LSD, that the whole brain lit up and it changed the harmonics and it'll... It, shut down the default mode network but the whole brain became fully integrated and it gave people a very very expanded sense of self what lsd does right. but they were showing that it was actually producing incredible harmonics in the brain and they actually showed that the brain's really more like a musical instrument than it is like anything else right. it was really phenomenal if you watch the uh psychedelica series i think it's episode three in series two Hmm. It's you'd love it. It's yeah, right. We up still subscribe to to Gaia Channel, so we should check that out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just watched it the other night. It was fantastic. But uh, I'm just curious. What are your thoughts on the use of psychedelic medicines and healing? And uh, yeah, you know, what are your concerns if you have any of of the legalization of right. things like psilocybin and 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 uh, all of the various things from whatever they're letting down the pipe? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I've, I've mixed some mixed feelings. Um, I grew up in the 60s, yeah. class of 65. <laughs> we were kind of the instigators of it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw a lot of abuse. You yeah. Know, I, I saw people hauled off to the insane asylum. Oh, yeah. You know, from a lot of abuse. Yeah. So I had, I had some skepticism. You know, we had the MDAs of the world and all that stuff going on when I was in college. Mm -hmm. So we did our dabblings and we did our things. Um, we inhaled. <laughs> yeah, we inhaled. <laughs> um, but then, you know, more recently, uh, I have a dear friend who participated in the first studies at UCLA with psilocybin. Mm -hmm. So I think it was 2002. She's a nurse, and she oversaw this study and wrote it up. Using psilocybin for people who had 
second diagnosis of terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. So these people are guaranteed to be dead. Right. And from cancer, mm -hmm. not the way you want to be checked out and you've got time to think about it. Yeah. So they're totally stressed out. And they did a study with psilocybin. I think it was the first one that they were doing with that. Um, and what they, what they found was they could do a buildup to the event with some therapy, have the event, usually an eight-hour session, with a guide, mm -hmm. come out of that, and a significant percentage of them never experience stress from going on their journey to dying. Mm, yeah, because they had enough of a death experience in the medicine to realize it was going to be okay. Yeah, or expand enough of their consciousness, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So they saw more outside rather than focused in. They saw the, the greater picture. Yes. And so what even happened on this, that they were going to follow these people for, I, I think it was six months or a year. It wasn't very long, but I think it was at least a year. They were all supposed to be dead in that year because they had a terminal diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. Short to live. Well, many of them lived longer than the study because the stress went away. Right. Which brings me up to uh, another story real quick. Uh, you probably heard about the guy who was diagnosed with cancer, terminal, he's going to die, and he quits everything, goes up to Yosemite, and lives for 20 more years. Right, just because he got away from the rat race. <laughs> he just got away, let it all go, right? Yeah. Let go, let God, whatever. Yes. Right? So um, that kind of stuff I, I think is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um I think the idea of having ceremony mm -hmm. and having somebody skilled in the ceremony of mm -hmm. it, I think is a valuable asset to yeah. the actual journey. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, unfortunately, I see a lot of people are just you know, recreational. Recreationally using, yeah, it's dangerous. Uh, exactly. I get people here coming to see me and reaching out to me from all over the world from going, unfortunately, what was shamanism is now turning into a tourist type Precisely. business. Precisely. And uh, one of the things they showed on Psychedelica is it's trashing the jungles all over the world because- I can imagine. People that showed right. garbage laying around and, and, and just people coming in and- It's like, it's like hiking uh, to, what, what's the, the big mountain everybody hikes? Uh, Nepal and, uh, you know, the big one. Mount Everest? Yeah. Mm -hmm. but it's a trash pile. Oh, geez, that's right. Sad, yeah. Exactly. Well, that's what's happening with these journeys. Yeah. Right? So- yeah, I've had a number of people that part of it's their own fault because what they'll do is they'll go do ayahuasca ceremonies and they'll run over somewhere else and they're doing LSD. Then they go somewhere else and they're doing DMT. Right. And they're they're not doing any integration work. That's it's not exactly. It's, it's more like it's it's to me it's almost as though people are desperate for a vision quest or a rite of passage and it's an unconscious unfolding. You know, like right. for me. When I was young, kickboxing, boxing, and motocross racing was how I initiated myself into the challenges of dealing with pain and knowing that I'm responsible for the outcome. And so because we've got this sort of passive population of almost unparented children that don't have a sense of direction in their life, it's almost like any great thrill is is uh, the next thing right. they've got to do, but they don't realize the magnitude of, <laughs> of a full on ayahuasca journey here. Right, and the whole thing is set and setting. Yeah, right. I mean, I was up in Hollyhock. Used to go up there every other year, and went to a rave, and these people were just out there to get hammered, hammered. Yeah, right. Beautiful setting, mm -hmm. right? But but nobody directing. Right, right. it was just hammered. Yeah. So I, I think I think it's got really v great value, and having studied with Stan Groff, you know, mm -hmm. actually reading him and actually visiting and seeing his work and what happened transpired at Esalen. Yeah. You know, I think that was hugely valuable. Oh my God! Yeah, he is. Uh, and and then that amazing. brings up the whole thing: Can you do it another way too? Yeah. You know, can you do it with holotrophic breath work? You can. Absolutely. You've done, been yeah. there, done yeah. it, right? You can do it with a lot of things. Exactly. Dancing, holotrophic breath work, drumming, exactly. music, singing, chanting, toning. Yeah, um, yeah there's, there's a lot of ways. And, and I've certainly been down the pipe. Tai Chi for me took me to incredibly complete states of union, non-dual right. non states of union. And... It, you know, it took me about 17 years for that to start happening. But the thing for me is because I do use plant medicines and they are, uh, they have been a part of my practice for a long time, uh, done very carefully and, and 
with a structure and all right. the things that are necessary. Um, but it was very important for me to, you know, you can have a lot in theogenes means God molecule. And, and, and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't having a chemical experience of God right. versus something that I could do naturally. So my first Samadhi happened when I was 35 meditating at the Self-Realization Fellowship temple right, right. in Encinitas. Right. And I just became completely and utterly one with the universe and it just blew my mind. And then Tai Chi, was I was able to get there, but I went even past being one with the universe. I went into a, a, what would classically be called a non-dual experience, which I don't really know how to describe it except to say it was though I was alive and dead at the same right, time would right. be the only way to describe it. I, I don't have words in the English language to describe it. Um, and then I've had, you know, a vast number of experiences on various types of plant medicines that, but so I've been able to correlate the experiences and right, I can, right. I can say that they're all the same, but they're all different. Yeah. But you're doing the, putting in the work to do that. Yes. And what I'm seeing is a lot of people, I, I, I'm going to say abusing yeah. the process, right? Yes. So they get their expansions just leading to a thrill ride. Well, it's kind of like the allopathic model. Right. Instead of, you know, uh, I'll quote Terrence McKenna. He says, you can sweep the monastery floor for seven years or you can do one hit of DMT. Right. So I think our instant gratification urge is people want to have this right. union experience, but they don't want to do any of the work. They don't want to do any of the preparation. And they don't realize that in order to become in a state of union, i.e. A, uh, a samadhi or a... A satori is a different kind of an experience, but a samadhi, a, a union experience, you, you have to go through the dissolution of the ego, and that is not an easy walk in the park. I mean, people don't realize, hey, guess what happens when you take a big enough dose of this? It means you actually die. <laughs> you <You're> die. God. <laughs> and uh, Vaporized. It can be an extreme struggle on the way out and on the way back, <laughs> and it can last for months or years if you don't know how to integrate yourself. Right. So I watch it all and I, I see it all. And, and, and they interviewed several experts. And one of the things they said is that we need to go more to the synthetics to protect nature. But all of them pretty much agreed that the synthetic medicines don't do the same things for you as the natural medicines. It's taking a piece of it, right? It's just like the, what you just said about digital music. Exactly. It's the same. You're getting the quarter inch of the 12 inch ruler. Yes, yes. Right? And it's hard to measure a, f a foot with a quarter inch ruler. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it takes a lot of adjustment. And which and which of the other part did you leave out? That's right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And how much air is there every time you yeah. move your quarter and, and inch ruler? And how much of you is going to resonate which, which part of that? Right? Yes. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost as though we're in a blender right now. You know, if you, you when you throw things in a blender, they get chopped to bits and spun, right? And something else comes out. Uh, I'm just curious: can we get through the blending? Whew. It's really Sorry. wild. I mean, I'm, as a parent, I'm, and you know, my I just became a grandfather. My my Paul Junior's partner had oh. a a baby on January the 13th, which turned out to be Paul's Congrats. mother's birthday. My, so my grandson yeah. was born on grandma's birthday. <laughs> Oh, on, wow. on his grandma's birthday, Paul's mother's birthday. Amazing. And, um, you know, so he, him and I have had several phone conversations. He's like, Dad, what the hell? Uh, and he lives in Portland. And he said, God, Dad, you should see Portland. It's turning into a battle Ooh. zone. He said, it's freaky from all the COVID the stuff. stuff. on the news. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. I don't watch the news, but I imagine Paul tells me it's, he said, the tent cities are growing like crazy. There's a lot of violence, people burning shit and destroying yeah. stuff. And. And Portland's known to be a progressive city, but he says you wouldn't know it the way people are behaving. He says no. it's almost like they're all brainwashed. Man, college, I took a trip up to Canada, stopped in Portland. They just made the big waterfall downtown. We hung out there for a day. It was like fantastic. I see the stuff that's going on now. I just can't believe it. Yeah. What happened to these people? It's kind of like, you know, Summer of Love, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of when we first started being in the Presidio in San Francisco. I'm in this medical ward, and outside, everybody's free flow, love, and music, and and then what happened to those people? I don't know. They turned to bad drugs. Mm. Heroin came in. Yeah, you know, anger, mm. a lot of fear, violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, bad stuff started happening at Haight Ashbury. 
the one good thing is I tell people that what's going on now, even as scary as it is, is not nearly as bad as a third world war. If we had a third world war, that would be it. Yeah. We just everything would be done. With the power of the weapons they wield today and all the defense systems they have, as anyone launches a nuclear weapon at another major country, they have a no win button. Yeah. No, yeah. you know, everyone goes. Yeah. So the fact that that we're not in a third world war, um, I think is a great alternative, meaning yeah. as ugly as it is, yeah. it could be worse. Well, on the news yesterday, Tulsi, the ex-congressperson uh, from Hawaii, the uh -huh. lady who is uh, in the service, she said it, it's gearing up to be a world war with Russia and what was the other country? Really? It's right now, in real time. Oh, my God. Yeah. Not to put it, you can cut that part out. <laughs> yeah, last night. What's the dispute? I don't know. She didn't get into that. Oh, I hope it's just a scare tactic. I don't know. She's pretty straightforward. You know, the military industrial complex oh. loves to start shit to make money, you know. Yeah. And I don't know. You, you watch all this. You know, the, the, the saving grace I have, and I'll share this for everybody listening, is I've been through the death experience on medicines where I've just, I didn't even know if I was alive or dead many times. I've had the complete experience of leaving this world and, right. and dissolving into the emptiness and being in other dimensions, completely other dimensions. And I've also had a coma before. So I've had that kind of a death experience, a, a departure, yeah. um, racing motocross and, running into i was practicing and racing and really high speed and um i couldn't see because there was so much dust on the road and uh, the guy ahead of me swerved around a pile of logs so we were racing on logging Jeez. roads and i couldn't see it and i drove head into a pile of logs going Whoa. about 60 55 60 miles an hour and ruined my motorcycle crushed my helmet and put me in a coma for a couple of days you had a helmet <laughs> well yeah not after that <laughs> i had a i had a ball of fiberglass <laughs> that was mushed <laughs> i got internal bleeding i had a, a one of the branches of the trees went through my abdominal wall and wow and it was uh bad news but my point is is that Having studied a lot on death, a lot of, you know, Ian Stevenson's work, watched right. countless documentaries, Ray Moody. I mean, I spent a lot of time studying it from the sort of academic perspective, but also really exploring it. And I think that if I could say anything to anybody, and also studying a lot of NDE people, right. that most of us are scared to death of death. But I think, strangely death is not nearly as scary as being alive in a world where you can't find anything to eat. You can't find anybody you can trust right. and nobody communicates and you're being turned into a prisoner for profit. So, and Steiner warned, um, Steiner predicted there would be a third world war. He said that the United States would become the next poverty stricken country and that china or india would become the next superpower and he said most people the devastation would be such that most people would commit suicide because they couldn't stand the thought of living that way right. and so i hope he was wrong right um jung predicted that the life as we know it would come to an end around 2036 he wouldn't let them publish that till after he died um but my point is, is we're all going to die anyhow. Uh, so that's a given. But for yeah. my kids, you know, I, and all the kids of the world, I like, what is with the adults of the world? Some of the people behind all this shit, they've got children too. Bill Gates has kids. It's like, what are you guys thinking? What are you, what are you doing? I used to always say that in medicine about cancer. Yeah. There's all these alternative therapies out there. I used to do tours of the Tijuana clinics, right? Mm -hmm. And I'd go, why are these people in the pharmaceutical industry completely canceling anybody with another therapy that tends to be highly effective? Yes. Don't they, aren't they afraid of getting cancer? Yeah. Do they want to have surgery, radiation, chemo? Do they want to be cut and burned and sliced? Yeah. It makes no sense to me, right? It's, it's just, 
it's almost as though people have lost their capacity for rational thought. Almost. It is unbelievable. You, you, uh, you, uh, I think if I remember right, you said you had some interesting experience or knowledge about ketamine. I've seen that surge going on, and I've actually yeah. had a couple of patients badly injured by ketamine. I can see it, could, how it could happen. Yeah, I did a session. Uh, you know, you do 10 sessions. Yeah. Um, I had a medical friend who was uh, into it for treating chronic Lyme people who were really dying from Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. So he offered me the opportunity, so mm -hmm. I did it. Yeah. And it was uh, an experience, right? And it was not quite expected. <laughs> yeah. I was surprised because it's, from my understanding, it's a very different experience than any of the other psychedelics. Yeah. It's controlled. It's an IV. Yeah. It's quick. It's yeah. an hour in, hour, you know, you're done. Yeah. Um, so um, how would you describe that? I have had people tell me it was very much like being in a float tank where you completely lost your sense of your body. Yeah, it could definitely be that. Um, again, set and setting is real important, yeah. right? Because it's so quick and and this is in a medical office, mm -hmm. not the best set and no. setting. And the thing that first dawned on me was how heightened your senses were. Uh -huh. So I could hear everything in the whole, I mean, big office, I could hear everything six offices away. Wow. So <laughs> quickly got some good music and yeah. Dina Permel and, mm -hmm. you know, brought in all my stuff. But uh, yeah, it, it wasn't what I expected. I was hoping to have the experience of, so I, I didn't mention back in my military days, I had a 13 days out of body experience. Oh, wow. So that was- 13 days? Yeah, 13 days. That's a good tour out in the astral <laughs> realm. <laughs> so I really wanted to touch base with that. So I, I kind of had a goal in mind to mm -hmm. uh, find out where I was. Yes. So that was my kind of goal of going through this experience. Um, but I didn't really have that experience. So it's IV, you're quickly in, you're kind of not there. Yeah. And it, you come out. So going in and out is when you kind of have a perception or then you're not pretty there. Cause it sounds like general anesthesia. Kind, well, that's what ketamine is. It's yeah. a short-term anesthesia, uh -huh. right? Um, so a couple times, you know, I had some universal experience of floating and float tank, right? Mm -hmm. Remember the old float tanks yeah, in Encinitas? Yeah, I've used them, yeah. Yeah. I never went to Encinitas, but two of my students own... They did own three, I think, two or three float tank centers in Laguna Beach. Oh, okay. And they recently... Uh, maybe a couple of years ago, sold them. Actually, I recently uh, did a podcast with Roseanne Grace. Her and her her partner Jeff Bryan owned them. Okay, and uh, they're they may have been in classes with both of us because Jeff's an HLC three and a Czech level three, okay. and she's an HLC three, and they've been in it for like twelve or fifteen right. years. But they um, uh, they owned float tanks, and so I I did uh, their float tanks, which was really cool but uh they they uh he, she became a quantum hypnotherapist and i'm for brain farting on the lady of the name you'd know her who does a lot of this where she was very famous for her pioneering work in in past life regression right. dolores cannon okay yeah yeah so she was trained by her mm -hmm. and so she came and, and did a past life regression on me which was wild as oh, hell yeah yeah and it's all in the podcast it's fairly recent if you want to listen okay. to it yeah that that was one of my biggest best experiences of my life not in ketamine though yeah but was with valerie hunt she oh did wow past yeah. life with me i didn't know that that's oh, an yeah. amazing oh, person good. to do it with yeah and it was so amazing about that was every single one related to religion <laughs> I have a lot of them too. My last life <laughs> it wore me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I my my first question for Roseanne is why do I have such a deep disdain for organized religion, particularly yeah. Christianity? And and don't get me wrong, I have nothing against real Christianity. Right. But you wouldn't believe I found myself right smack dab in the middle of an experience where I was a Knights Templar. Yeah, and I was being killed. I was being killed because of, long story, but something was happening within the Templars that was dirty, right. and I didn't want to participate, and the rule was, you do what we all do or you have to get killed as right. a secret organization, right. and I said, I can't do this, and so one of the guys stuck a sword so right through me, right front to back, Yeah. but uh, so that was one of my experiences of that and i've had other past life regressions right. where i where i found that i was a native american indian one time they put us all inside of a church and locked the door and lit it on fire Whoa. the christians did Whew. 
It was a small wooden. That would leave a residue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, so, you know. So, so back to ketamine. Really yeah. Quick. So the best thing that happened about it, though, was coming in and out. So why do we end up in our professions? How do I end up being a chiropractor? I'm a big kinesthetic guy. Yeah. Why did I shape thousands of surfboards? You like to feel. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I go in there, well, yeah, this is my thing. But coming out, for some reason, so you had to have a, a friend or somebody sit with you. Uh-huh. And uh, I think I had Bill Rimson once. Do it. Uh-huh. And so I said, oh, just rub my feet with you. And so I'm coming out. And, and you know, they're controlling the drip, right? So yeah. So it's controlled. Whoa, it was like this amazing experience. So being a kinesthetic person, it was really a powerful touch experience of, mm-hmm. of very, like you're, you're alive, mm-hmm. right? The touch was alive. Your feet were alive. It was really profound. But the most profound thing that happened was uh, um, one time, Julie, if you don't know, remember. Julie, Julie Remsen, yeah. She's sitting, in, she's going to sit with me. She starts telling me about early on in their life when they first came back to San Diego, her and her husband. Um, and he's brilliant, MIT graduate, atomic engineer, blah, blah, blah. And they're on the boardwalk in South Mission, their home, and he's introduced to LSD. Mm-hmm. And she's telling me this experience while we're getting ready. And then she says, but he took a hit and didn't get off. He said, I need another one. Took another one. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty soon. I know that he's, he's situation. Going, he's going, balloons, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's so amazing. So she's telling me this. I'm thinking nothing. I'm getting ready. You know, I got my stuff on. I got my little, you know, my little altar. I'm yeah. really getting into it. I'm all comfortable. Go in, go through the thing. And I'm kind of drifting again, kind of like a float tank. I'd say that's a good description. Yeah. Come out. As I'm coming out, I'm literally popped into his body walking down the boardwalk. Oh, I think you told me a little bit about to that. That's wild. Completely. I'm having the same experience of everything balloons and <laughs> morphed. It was. It was really transformative. That must have been a popped. shock for Julie. <laughs> <laughs> and I come out and say, yeah. and I'm laughing, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh, hysterical laughing. Oh, no, no. What? And she's like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> What'd and she I, say when you told her? I told her, you won't believe what just happened. Yeah, she was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so that was the best of the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a, a couple of people badly injured and and it put them into a state of deep derealization that they could not come out of really yeah yeah very serious um one of the guys couldn't walk he he the sad case he went to a professional clinic in colorado they're all over yeah i mean they popped up everywhere yeah and um he was the last person of the day the guy overdosed him but when it was time to close the business, he was still way deep in the experience. Really? And the, the clinician that was controlling it said, well, I've got to go now. It's the end of the day. Whoa. And he says, well, I can't move. I, I can't move. I'm yeah, still, there is a I'm phase still, where you can't move. Yeah. So the guy actually had him crawl to the front door and sit in the waiting area and wait for someone to come Too get bad. him. But he left him on his own. No. Completely left him on wow. his own. And he, and, and this guy's an uh, ex-professional motocross racer that's had 19 concussions. In oh, fact, wow. you might know who he is. I don't want to say his name. I can, I think I know. Yeah. Yeah. And so he came to me and I did about a month of work to center I him. I think and I might have even seen him early yes. on. Yeah. Many years ago. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, I, and I had another one that had almost an identical, uh, not the same scenario, but just his reaction was that it put him into deep realization right. and he wasn't able to get out of it. So I'm, I'm always oh. watching all these things go on and it's amazing that well, even though com- they have, it comes back to set and setting. Yeah. Right? Even though they have and professional clinics, it's not being done professionally. Right. And, and, you <laughs> it's know like, what what's I, going on so, here? So we start our talk off about, and I mentioned psychiatrists and I thought somewhere in there cause they're damaged. Yeah. Right. Or money or whatever. Well, what I'm seeing is they get paid by the hour. Yeah. Here was a moneymaker. Uh, right, so they could now because they they don't charge insurance companies usually. Yeah. So it's a cash five hundred bucks a journey. It's one hour in and out. Yeah. So I don't know. I some of the clinics I've seen they look like just money makers too. Yeah. Well, it's it's therapy. kind of the way that everything seems to go. Um, yeah. if you could encapsulate your own spiritual philosophy, how would you wrap? Wrap, wrap it up into a package. What do you think is life's all about? I mean, and what do you think happens when you die? 
whoa. <laughs> Let's see, how much more time do we have? <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, geez, that's a huge question. Um, what's my spiritual journey, you know? Um, I mean, your spiritual philosophy. Like, what do you think's going on in life? What is it? Yeah. Um, it's obviously bigger than me. Yeah. And it's really about connecting with the greater spirit. Yeah. Um, greater force, greater, mm -hmm. what we were born called. The divine God, or? Divine. Theosphere. Um, yeah. And I think we get glimpses. Yeah. You know, we get glimpses in our dreams. We get glimpses when we're hanging by a thread, be it literally or figuratively. Um, so I think it's, it's really about the curiosity to experience that. Yeah. And then uh, about having a greater purpose and being able to share that. Yeah. And I think that's, again, early on I said, we're addicted learners, but we're learners and sharers, right? Yes. To learn yeah. and to share. Mm -hmm. And I think that in itself is a calling and a spiritual journey. It is, yeah. Right. Um, as far as what's after, well, I've studied Moody and all those people, right? Mm -hmm. um, I looked in the mirror. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on <laughs> and LSD. The and the candle flame. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, me too. Many times. <laughs> and I was always amazed at both. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that there's, there's a, a greater continuum, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that we are part of that. You know, they'll saying that we're a, a being that's experiencing, our, our life is experiencing the, the We're spirit. a spiritual being having a human, human experience. experience. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think that's so true. It is, yeah. You know, and the old drop in the ocean, right? Yeah. It, where does the river and the ocean and the drop all merge? Yes. Right. Rumi says you're not a drop of the ocean, you're the ocean it's in a drop. Drop, right. Which is really beautiful. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, it's very powerful. It is. If you would dive into that, so... Yeah, I'd say that's kind of sums it up. Yeah. It's um life is very very interesting and it's magical and it's mysterious and and death is even more magical and mysterious. Yogananda says in his lectures where he talks about death, he says death is like having a thousand orgasms at once. It's nothing to be afraid of. Right. Um but from doing so much soul recovery work and, and shamanic work, I can tell you there's an in-between realm that has got a lot of people that are have been become so afraid of God through religious programming that they won't move into the light. Right. They're afraid that they're going to burn in hell. And so that's the part that, that I feel sad about. And, you know, there's days I wish I could just go help them all, but I've, right. many people have contacted me because somebody's died and they want me to check on them or whatever and i've helped people transition well, well people like the tibetan tradition right mm -hmm. they have a whole process, process. the egyptians right? had that yeah. yeah and how we got left out of all that yeah. is just amazing i mean yeah. now it's it's just hospitalized right it's yeah like move them off to somewhere yeah get you them know? out of the society kind of thing yeah push them push the garbage to the edge of the room. I remember an interesting conversation I had with somebody about, uh, was it Elizabeth Kubler-Ross? Oh, wow, well, that's a powerful person to have a conversation yeah. with. An expert on death, too. Yeah, and so she had written all about that, right? Mm -hmm. I've got was, a book by her on it. Right, but this person told me that when she actually died, she was stuck in that place of not wanting to transition mm -hmm. and, and literally got stuck and feared. Yes. You know, and overwhelming mm -hmm. to the point of wanting to you know, recant everything she had said before yeah. when actually faced at the gates of death. Yeah. Whoa, that kind of struck me. It's like, whoa, I thought, you know, I thought you had this so together that doing that transition would have been easier. Right. Right? But it wasn't. Yeah, I don't, you know, um, I don't want to say this person's name, but you probably would remember she was one of our instructors I don't know if you heard about this. Um, no, she was she wrote a Czech thesis on nutrition and on um, the dangers of uh, fructose, corn fructose. Hmm. And very smart girl, very pretty girl. Her husband um, got involved in 
something that led to enough stress that he shot her and his two kids, their two kids in their sleep and then killed himself. No, I didn't hear about this. Yeah. So. And they, they all died? They're, yeah, he shot, oh, wow. shot the two kids and her in her sleep and then shot himself. Whoa. And so when I heard about this, uh, several people reached out to me and said, Paul, can you check in on them and make sure they're transitioning okay? And I found them in the astral realm and it was not pretty. Um, she was just crying her eyes out and she was livid at him. She was, and he was so utterly embarrassed and ashamed of what he had done, but too late now. And so I had to work with them to help them through and, and to move forward. And yeah. I'm glad I did because they'd probably be still sitting there. Uh, it was pretty intense. Yeah. It was very intense. It was very emotional for me because she was a friend of mine. She was exactly. studied with me for years and she was a very sharp girl. And uh, she was at the Czech conference. She was a presenter there. And some weird shit goes on in the world. Wow. Yeah, I had kind of a similar experience with... Uh, I was studying, you know, intuitive writing and bringing in, you mm -hmm. know, spirit guides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, automatic writing. Yeah, and touching base. And it was a group in Del Mar. We met every week. And about, I don't know, 10th weekend, we're a pretty tight group. Mm -hmm. We're sitting there doing it, and all of a sudden, the energy changed dramatically in the room. I mean, it was like... Dark energy. Dark, yeah. dark, dark. And, you know, we we're all like, whoa, man, what's going on? You know, smudge, burn, <laughs> clear the area. Yeah. Well, it turns out, unbeknownst to us, there was a wreck on five. So right by Del Mar, you know, the, that going down the hill there as you're coming, mm -hmm. going north. Mm -hmm. I think like 15 people in a van caught on fire and they all died. Oh, my God. And, and we all tapped into that. Wow. At once. Jeez. And talk about stuck in this plane. Of, oh, yeah. Oh, man, it was wicked. I mean, it was like felt like scarred us. All of us. It was so intense. Wow. Yeah, so... Well, that's how random event generators get moved, isn't it? <laughs> right. Right? When yeah. enough people move like that. Well, I know that the majority of the death experiences I've looked into, which has been a lot of them, um, have been really beautiful. And I don't know how it is that I'm here because I have definitely died and somehow got back. <laughs> right. Um and the reason I'm talking about this is not to scare people or be negative, but I'm saying, look, the world's spinning down. I mean, <clears throat> I I don't normally talk about this, but I'll risk it. I, I'll just keep it brief, but uh, I work with spirit guides, and um, one of my spirit guides is Serenos, the god of nature, the Celtic god of nature, which I showed you my painting of him. And I said to him, I said you know he told me he says i'm i'm here to help you write your new book because it's important and i said well and he told me what the situation with nature was and it was really freaking wild i wish you could have seen this this was in my past life regression this right. happened and uh he showed me the mycelial structure of nature the whole mycelium right and he right. showed me how all the chemicals are killing it mm -hmm. and he said what you think of as the internet is a very good analogy for the mycelial network. And that the mycelial network, he says, is the most well-integrated communication system on this planet. And he said it pretty much covers the whole globe. Right. He, he said it even makes it under the oceans. Wow. And uh, then he showed me how all the chemicals and all the destruction is wiping it out so that the earth is no longer able to talk to itself. Right. And... Uh, he, he told me the time is limited before there's going to have to be a massive shift on the planet, which will drastically reduce the population or the earth's not going to survive. And he explained to me how it would happen, which I don't want to tell people because it's a bit intense. But he, I said to him, I said, well, is there any point in me even doing this, all this work? Right. I said, I'm really pushing myself hard to write this book and try to inform people in my podcast. He said... I'm going to be honest with you. He said, the work's important and it's important for you to give it your best because that's what you actually came here to do. Right. He said, that's why you reincarnated is specifically for this event. <laughs> he said, you don't know it, but I'm telling you. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. You are here for this. Mm-hmm. You chose to be here knowing this was going to happen. I'm like, oh God, that was not the best choice. <laughs> but uh, um, I said, well, is it any, is it worth it? Can I even get the word out to enough people? He said, there's enough of you, people like you, that are speaking the truth to get the word out. He said, the problem is, is people are so trapped in their behavioral programming. He said, it's the, exactly. the lag time between getting the understanding that we have to change and making the change. He says, he highly doubts it's possible. But he said, you have to maintain your spirit and you got to give it your all. He says, just like when you're a boxer and a kickboxer, you can't stop just because right. you're in pain or you're down. You got to get up and give it your best. Right. Or when I was riding bulls in the rodeo or racing motocross and fly off and be broken to pieces, but my soul would say, get back on. And then sometimes I did and was managed to win the race. But if I would have just give up, I wouldn't have done anything except been disappointed right. in myself. Right. So I think the spirit is, is that we've all really got to, we've really got to start taking care of each other and the planet. And we got to, uh, be wise enough to say what is real and what isn't real. And are we being given information by people who have our interest at heart or is it selfish interests? And it takes the willingness to do the research to find the people that are wise enough to trust and not just believing anything and being lazy about it. Completely. So I think that the reason I'm sharing this is because we really are facing um, a situation that we've now reached the point where the impact on the children of the future is, is drastic. And if we don't get together and work together to make the world a better place for the kids that are going to have to inhabit it, we're leaving them with a mess that they don't deserve. I really don't think they deserve this. Uh, what, what are we doing to their, their formation? Right? Yes, their developmental formation. Just in utero. If you're in utero during COVID, when you're locked down, you're... Yeah. Everybody's losing their business. Everybody's been shut down. Can't go outside in the sun. Yeah. Can't go out in nature. Yeah. Well, what happens to that? Well, they actually studied it, mm-hmm. right? And they show the brain changes. Shrinking, shrinks. Completely. Yeah. Too much cortisol. <sighs> it's amazing. I mean, and they're going to be running the world. Well, one of the things that my soul did show me, and I'll close out on this, my soul showed me that there is a lot of very powerful kids coming into the plane right now. And two of them are my kids. Both of them told me they came here just to be here for this. They both knew there was a big shift shift coming and they both came with skills that are needed. And they said to me uh, before they were born, they said, we're here and your job is to activate our knowledge. That's why we chose you and and Angie and Penny and, They both said, we chose you carefully. We watched for a long time to decide who to choose as parents. I said, well, thanks for waiting until I was 54. (laughs) (laughs) A little late in the game. (laughs) That reminds me of Valerie Hunt when I did my past life. And she goes, "Uh, when did your soul come into your body? It's clear. Seven months. She goes, that's kind of late. <laughs> well, they had to pick and choose. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the point I'm closing on is as, as, as dark as things can get, there are, and there's many documentaries out now documenting kids being born with extraordinary abilities from, oh, yeah. from telekinesis to telepathy to, uh, you know, lots of neat right. skills. So I think that we've got to make space for these kids and we've got to learn to listen to them. Yeah. And uh, maybe we'll get some young geniuses that can pull the thing together. And Yeah. I, I love Stephen Porges' as Polyvagal. You probably mm-hmm. heard his name. Yeah. Um, but I, he, I have he a makes, book by him. Yeah, he's got tons of books. and But he d- developed the Polyvagal and his, his, one of his big concerns is, is with children, getting into school that's a mold to fit into, and if they don't fit that mold because they're working at a different part of their nervous system, yeah. they get diagnosed ADD yeah. and they get medicated into yeah. submission. Mm-hmm. So I see, you know, the old story with Einstein, 
if he was in school today, he'd be on a drug and yeah. never done anything. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping these kids somehow get homeschooled. Yes, <laughs> or, well, or mine are. Or, yeah, exactly. Or Steiner School. Yeah, exactly. They find a, a path out of the box, right, yeah. for their education, and they don't get mugged and drugged and yeah. washed into some crazy stuff. I, I tell everybody on all these podcasts, so forgive me for being redundant, my dear loving listeners. The best thing you can do right now is do what you love to do. If you love to sing, sing truth. If you love to paint, paint some truth. If you love to dance, dance in the name of healing. Whatever it is that you love to do, just put your intention on integration and helping awake people awaken and being part of the healing and that, exactly. that way, at least if it all goes to hell in a handbasket, we all know we did our best. Absolutely. What and, else can and, you do? You know, I, I, I was able to study several years ago with uh, Dewitt Jones, a famous photographer. I'm totally into photography. And he gave me this, this armband. Celebrate what's right with the world. Yeah, yeah. Right? Celebrate what's right with your life now. Yeah. I, I, people come to me with the worst disease, and I tell them, well, what's right with your life? Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> oh, come on. I bet I can find something. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking at me. There's yeah. something. Yeah, you can see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got here. And they fight me tooth and nail. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm holding on. <laughs> yeah. I'm holding on to what's wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good job. How's so that we don't work? want to hold on what's wrong with the earth as we know it today. You yeah. Know, celebrate what's right with it. And that celebration is like the drop in the water, right? Yeah. Those ripples It's the go ripple, out. yeah. The ripple effect. And um, I think there is a lot to celebrate. And I uh, actually believe that the very technology that's got us in trouble used intelligently can get us out of trouble. I'd like to see it start happening. Me too. I, I would. But, you know, think about it. You and I right now, in a matter of seconds, could have a long conversation with a scientist in Africa exactly. who knows something that might have taken months or years to reach us before the internet. Exactly. So that's why I say whatever it is that you've got to put on the table, get it out there. And if they censor it, then get, keep getting it out there. <laughs> put it everywhere. Just keep republishing, republishing. And if they block you, then go to someone else's phone. And then somebody's going to come up with a, you know, like Brian and, you know, Adams and all these people are coming up with their, their platform. So it's yes. starting to happen. Yeah. Brian Rose. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of them are. And, and, uh, I already have one set up in case they oh, come after really? me. So I'm like, I'm ready to make the move. <laughs> Speaking of a move, J.P. Sears. I love J.P. He's doing the job, baby. I came across a picture of him the other day. He stopped by for me to tape up his knee. You know, he's all very straight looking. And, oh, you know, is right? He was his trainer clothes then, right? Uh-huh. Talking about bringing satire to consciousness. Oh, right? yeah. It's so good. I'm so uh, I'm so proud of the guy. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> I tell him how much I love and appreciate him regularly, and you know he's got a little boy now too. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so he's... thank God for JP because <laughs> he's putting it out there, and he's he's. Uh, I'm proud to say that he was my protege for exactly. seven years. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So I think that's a a bright light. It is right, and there's an inspiration for all of us. Exactly. And the other thing is we got to remember not to lose our sense of humor. Exactly. I mean, you got to look at it and if it's, it's, if, it might be fucked up, but we can still find the humor in it. Cause if you can find the humor in it, then you can still work with it. Right. You know, even if we do like in laughter yoga, laugh as if, right. Yeah. You know, if you just laugh, the old thing we talked about, it's taping up your lips, yeah. you know, smile, it's my, yeah. not realizing that we're actually releasing all these endorphins. Yeah. Right? So yeah, we, we can do it. Well, what a great conversation. And, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Oh, my, my pleasure. And so sorry about the, the boo-boo that happened the first time. That was so odd. But I think it was just a good reason to get you back up here again when it wasn't so cold outside. And we now can sit I'm in looking the forward to looking at your sound. Cha- your, uh, yeah, we'll take, water, you to the, take you out to the, to the sound chamber pile. water charger. <laughs> um, we talked about your websites. You want to just give the websites sure. once more? Yeah. Um, so the photography one is surf fo- surf photo la Jolla. Dot com. You might La want to spell La Jolla. Yeah. yeah. L-A-J-O-L-L-A. Most people go La Jolla. Yeah. But it's La Jolla.com. And that's got photos, surf, uh, birds, animals. And his photography scenes. is mind-blowing. So definitely look. <laughs> it's pretty good. I also teach online at the Anthenaeum. It's a music arts library uh-huh. in La Jolla. Um, 
not during this quarter, probably the next one, but I, I really like teaching photography in person. Yes. Rather than, but if you follow La Jolla Anthenaeum, it's a 120 year old music arts library. Cool. Um, and then my regular one is uh, drcliffoliver.com or centerforbalance.net. Same, they feed in the same one okay. that just talks about you know our office. We don't update it that much. We post stuff on Facebook occasionally. Mm-hmm. Um, I see clients Monday and Wednesday, one to four afternoon. Okay. Consultations um, around the world. We have clients in India, Singapore. Mm-hmm. All over the place. That's a good thing about technology. Yep. Yep. So uh, if anybody wants consults, they want just a, you know, advice on something. Yeah. I can give it educationally. I can't do it as a patient. My mm. malpractice people won't let me do that. Oh, okay. But if they want to write, I'll be happy to do emails with them. We just charge by the minute. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's available too. And that's uh, DRCC Oliver at att.net. That's my office one. That's DRCC Oliver okay. at att.net. If they write that, my staff reads the email Monday, Wednesday. They forward it to me. Um, so we answer questions. You uh, had somebody get in touch with me from Switzerland recently. Yeah, I give your name out to lots yeah, of people. Yeah, somebody with a cancer client. Yeah. We were able to give them lots of good info on treating cancer. In fact, I knew a doctor in Switzerland who's probably one of the best cancer treatments in the world. Oh, good. So that, I think, might have worked out well. Yeah, great. Yeah. So got that available and uh, playing lots of music. I'm into the U bass right now, bass, All right guitar. On. It moves, if, you know, boom, yeah. boom. You've got some because Victor Wooten drum. in your soul. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Big fan of Victor Wooten. Yes. Check him out online. He's got a great video on uh, music. Yes, and if you haven't read his book, The Music Lesson, yep. it's one of the best books in my library. It's very deep and touching. It's not hard to read by any means. Easy book. It's very beautiful, though. And he just came out with a new one, just came out, The Spirit of Music. Right. Excellent. Book. And just so you know, The Music Lesson isn't for people that want to learn to play music. It's about right. how the principles of music apply to life and spiritual development precisely yeah well what a great time i'm so glad we got to do it again yes thank you we'll do it and i'll take you out and show you the water charger and uh, play a few sounds play some flute in there and brought the didgeridoo excellent (laughs) all right lots of love everybody and thanks for having me thanks for doing your best each of you to contribute to positive change in the world. And remember, just do what you love to do with the intention of bringing us all together, harmonizing, and be brave enough to do your research. Study people like uh, greenmedinfo.com, mercola.com, look up Zach Bush, Z A C H Bush MD. Those are Children's Defense Fund. Yes, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. Jr.'s uh, newsletter is Children's Defense Children's Defense Fund. It, Children's Defense Fund. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, those are some of my Del favorites. Del Big Tree. Del the Big high Tree. Wire. Yeah. So there's a lot of great resources out there with amazing people telling the truth. Cowan, Tom Cowan. Tom Cowan. Yeah. Um, there's a number. I've interviewed a lot of people. Sherry on this. Tinpenny. I ran Sherry into Tinpenny. her recently. Oh, right on. Yeah. I said, do you remember the time? <laughs> remember when he ke- she came out yeah. to Encinitas? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. She said, oh, yeah. I remember. We yeah. chatted about it. Yeah. That's fantastic. Dr. Sh- Sherry Tenpenny. Um, and my podcast on vaccinations with her is number two. It used to be number one, but one of my solo podcasts passed it, but right. it's still number two. I think it's right at 40,000 listens, which is pretty good. And, um, Judy Mikovits, another one to yeah, follow. Judy Mikovits. And there's another lady, um, that, uh, Ben Greenfield, uh, Ben, um, Stewart references, and I can't remember her name, but if you go to wakinginfinity.com, you can get a lot of great information from Ben Stewart. Uh, and I also did a podcast with him that you maybe have already listened to by the time this one comes out, and he shares that resource in there. But the the closing comments I have is, let's stay positive. You know, let's not give up. When I was a boxer, I gave it my all. When I was a motocross racer, I learned never let go of the handlebars until Mother Nature rips you off the bike and uh, a lot of times i save myself from crashes and and let's uh use it as an opportunity to grow and to strengthen and to um have spiritual growth and development and celebrate what we have together and protect mother earth to the best of our ability and as houston smith said before he died 
his final message was just be a little kinder to yourself, a little kinder right. to the each other, and a little kinder to the world. And I think if we just do that together, honestly, then we'll do okay. And if we use the very technologies that are be using to, being used to prison us to free ourselves, we'll be okay too. Right. And if you're a tech whiz genius hacker, call me. <laughs> 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 Let's cook up a plan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, celebrate what's right with your life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Celebrate what's right. Yeah. You know, in the moment. Yeah. Today. And, and if you're anxious and nervous, you can always use the little technique I learned from Eileen Troberman, and that's just take your thumb and put it to your little finger and just say the words, where can I find a little ease in my life right now? Right. There must be a little ease in my life right now. So you just use that concept. You do five times on each finger, and you do both hands. And interestingly, by the time you get to the other hand and finish, you feel ease from within. Absolutely. So, you know, give yourself permission to find some ease. And then from that place of ease, your creativity will emerge and we'll all do magic together. And thank you to the podcast sponsors I love you. I'm grateful for the way you do your business and the quality standards that you have and the interest you have in the well-being of other human beings. And thank you to each of you for anything you buy from the sponsors because a little bit of that comes to me to support the podcast and help uh, free me so I don't have to work seeing clients and doing things that would stop me from doing the podcast so that I can bring people like Dr. Oliver and many of the other great minds that you've had the pleasure of listening to. So lots of love. Till next time, I will see you soon. We are safe. We are home. We are whole. A whole great spirit. Namaste. Namaste. Amen. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Dr. Clifford Oliver. If you are interested in consulting with Dr. Oliver as a patient, you can visit his website at thecenterforbalance.net for more details and contact information. Mention that you heard him on Living 4D with Paul Check for a 20% discount off the first hour's consultation. To check out Dr. Oliver's amazing photography, visit his Facebook page at cliff.oliver.96. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living 4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living 4D with Paul Check. Check out Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to check videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chikiva.com. 